three, two, one. What's up, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube? Sardonicast2988 coming at you live once again through the power of the internet. <laughs> We're Sardonicast. I'm Adam from Your Movie Sucks. And who else? I'm... <laughs> oh, that was perfect. <laughs> Why can uh, we never start these crimes? That I, I, that's exactly Fuck's what sake. I'm looking for. That's what I want. Alex, you go I was ahead. trying to, because I can hear how tired you Just want, fucking say your name. <laughs> Alex from I Hate Everything. Who is that over there I can hear? Ralph from Ralph the Movie Maker. YouTube.com slash. Okay. <laughs> uh, hey, everybody. Hope you're having a good. Hi. I don't even know what date this is airing. We're actually recording this a week earlier than usual, so the Fantano video was posted yesterday. Great guest, by the way. What did you guys think? Yeah. Oh, he was terrific. I love him. He was awesome. Yes. Yeah, he was very I would good. suck his dick. If he, I uh, oh. Mm, goddamn right. Oh, really? All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Certainly dispelling <laughs> those rumors. <laughs> Doing a great job was, at that. He was great. <laughs> he was awesome, but like... We didn't get a chance to talk about a lot of things we wanted to talk about. Wow. Well, you know, we had to talk to Anthony about stuff. He's oh, interested. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so a, we got a few lot topics of that we kind of skipped over yeah. last week. And the reason why we're recording this a week earlier than usual is because I'm actually out of town next week. Anyway, that's kind of not important. What is important yeah. is that we oh, start talking right. about the given topics of the week. And so if if there's this huge news story that happens before this podcast is aired and we didn't talk about it, it's probably because we recorded this a little early. Ralph, you wanted to talk about something, didn't you? Oh, uh, well, I wanted to mention Channel Awesome, if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, so sure. Like we should, because it's... Adam, you said their, their incompetency has been well-known for a year or so, but well, recently a little document came out confirming... Our suspicions <laughs> that Would you want to give the Cliff Notes show. version of what we're talking about here? Uh, so there's a place called Channel Awesome where the Nostalgia Critic, I guess that's the most famous thing on there, right? It's not Nostalgia Critic, yeah. Doug Walker. You almost said Nutshack. Yeah, <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> um, so Doug Walker and everyone in running the company is incompetent. And there have been multiple <laughs> issues like uh, sexual, uh, what, what is it? Uh, God, I forgot the word for it. Harassment? Sexual harassment. That, I was going to say sexual assault. I'm like, I don't think anyone got assaulted. All kinds <laughs> of sexual harassment. I'm surprised you forgot um, that word, yeah. given your history. Yeah, it's a weird thing. I forgot. I don't know why. But So there's all kinds of sexual harassment going on behind the scenes that no one talked about. Uh, apparently, Doug doesn't own the rights to Nostalgia Critic. Someone else does, and they keep him on the company, even though he's incompetent, and he's the CEO. <laughs> all kinds of shit. So I just want us to mention it a bit because I feel like we should. I never really got the impression that the business was being run like a professional business. It very much just seemed like the forefront of new internet media with some crazy guys and a wild dream, you know, wanting to pursue their passions, but not necessarily having the uh, experience and know-how in terms of creating a successful business or yeah. knowing how to deal with employees, et cetera, et cetera. So I didn't read into it super far because I don't really care. <laughs> but I, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, like, it doesn't really make a difference, you know, if, if, yeah, I don't know, I get if, it. if somebody wants to condense it into an entertaining video, keyword being entertaining, then I'll watch it. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I'm not, I don't really give a shit about reading into documents of people saying other people did other things, et cetera, et cetera. I know that there's some pretty um, concerning allegations in there for sure. And I watched um, yeah. Quentin Reviews's... Quentin Reviews has a great video. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw his video on it. Mr. Medeker has made some videos on <laughs> Channel Awesome in the past, which had uh, quite a lot of hilarious, uh, juicy things in those videos, <laughs> but he's yeah. a lot more mean on his channel. Well, have you guys ever been a fan of Nostalgia Critic or anything on Channel Awesome? Uh, Alex because... and I were in a video of his. Well, of course, but yeah. I'm saying, were you in it because you enjoyed their content or just because you're like, oh, we're all banding together to fight the copyright system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was more well, about to... people who think fair the use. copyright system is bad. Yeah, For it was me. More about fair what use, about you, so... Alex? I found it odd when we, when we were asked to partake in that video how oh yeah on the on the channel awesome twitter um 
I can't remember who was actually messaging me, but they were like, yeah, okay, I'll relay that to um, Doug. Yeah. And it's like, why why can't Doug do it? I, I don't understand. Like, yeah. He's a busy guy. I hope we're not. I uh, guess. I don't, I don't like to be, uh, <laughs> well, it doesn't, it doesn't, I like being friends with everybody. That's my thing. I like being yeah, friends sure. with everybody, but at the yeah. same time, I don't want that to compromise my integrity. And, uh, mm-hmm. I don't think it's that yeah. big of a deal to mention this, but we had a Skype call, uh, where we were in a call with Nostalgia Critic and the other guy, whoever runs the channel awesome. Wait, was Doug actually in that call? I can't he, even No, remember. he was, but he said like really? two words. The entire time. I don't even remember him being there. Oh, he was mm-hmm. there. He was he was was just basically not talking the entire time. He said a couple words and it was huh. that was oh. a very odd experience for me because it was like either Doug doesn't give a shit or he's not really <laughs> involved. I, I don't really know. I don't yeah. really know yeah, what that's... that was about. That was just very odd. Especially when, I don't know, everybody else I know, it's like when you are the forefront of your channel, especially, you know, if you're marketing yourself like that, you would think that you would have some sort of a drive or passion or any sort of care to at least be the person interacting with other people that you're trying to get onto your projects, you know? Like, that was really Yeah, I found that very weird. Yeah, it was really strange. I've always, not always, I mean, obviously I'm not now, but... When I was younger, I loved Nostalgia Critic, and they had mm-hmm. that that guy with the glasses website where all the critics would come together, and they were all friends, and they all respected each other, and they would all create reviews. Or were they? Uh, at first, I think I think at first everyone was very genuine and nice, but there's a point it got so big that you need to start running it competently, like a business. Mm-hmm. But I don't think they did. <laughs> yeah. No, they didn't, because they still acted as if it's a bunch of friends, but really what they were doing, they made movies every year, these anniversary movies, and they would fly people out and not pay them to work long hours. And it's, you know, they, they would have to follow Doug Walker's script that he wrote for them. And it's like, yeah, well, that's when everything kind of fell apart. Yeah, I, uh, I've uh, definitely watched a few of those movies in uh, Rabbit with other people mm-hmm. as we make fun of them. They are very embarrassing yeah. films. No, they're, <laughs> they're terrible. But at first, I loved them because, again, it's about that community. Like, yeah, it's not a good movie. Because you were a kid. Yeah, because I was a kid. And I'm like, look at all these friends. And they make content for children. Exactly. (laughs) But they were all friends. And they're like, we're going to make a movie. And it's going to be shit. But we love it because we love each other. And then that became, we're going to make cash cow awful movies every year where no one wants to do them. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know they were making movies. Like, I'm so... I've never been oh, that yeah. interested in the channel. They were, channel. like, five I, hours long or something. Yeah, really? To Boldly Crazy. Flee is yeah. a four-hour-long film <laughs> that doesn't it's make any sense. <laughs> well, they were filmed in that white room. No, they're, they're like, all kinds of locations. It's crazy, the, the amount of characters there are. Pretty much the same locations you'd imagine if you were 15 years old making a movie with your friends. They're, like, in the playground okay. sometimes. <laughs> like, yeah. They're, like, just the in the woods. middle of a field... <laughs> Like in a desert, <laughs> just like That'd random locations where they clearly didn't have to pay any money to be there, and then some green screen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gosh. They did have VFX artists for that one, though. I don't think he. I think yeah, he did so pay did him, actually. Space Cop. Paid a minimum wage. Yeah. <laughs> Sp- Space Cop had better effects. Oh, yeah. I know the, the guy that the did flame the movie. effects for Space Cop, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he's he Canadian. He did a pretty good job, I gotta say. Yeah. If only they. Well, Space Cop, we can save for another day. Let's not... Yeah, let's, let's talk. Let, let us discuss that to. another day if we're going to burn all of our bridges. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to watch it first. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's uh, I, f- I feel more bad for everyone involved than I, I am angry because I don't think anyone went into it with bad intentions, but no one knew what they were doing and it all yeah. fell apart. So They're just a victim of how popular they become, I guess, on this unknown platform where anyone can become kind of like a huge business out of nowhere. It was was too much for them to handle. I mean, what more is there really to say about this than it's bad? Yeah. You know, like not paying your workers and treating them poorly is bad. And, you know, yeah, they would fire people for like showing up late to meetings, could kick them off the site forever. Like crazy shit like that. Yeah, there seems to be like a disconnect between how a business should act ethically and the gut reactions of individuals who just so happen to have the same powers as a business, you know, just people who aren't, who really shouldn't be in positions of power if they're going to do that. 
you know, you should try mm -hmm. to treat people fairly and equally, or at least how you'd like to be treated and not be vindictive about your business approaches. Because at that point, it's no longer just like, ooh, I hate my friend and I'm going to be an asshole to my friend. It's you're taking away someone's livelihood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, exactly. and that's a very different implication. And so I can totally understand why this has become such a big deal at this point. I mean, these guys were huge inspirations for a lot of critics, including mm -hmm. myself. And now it's just sad to see it all. I mean, plus their content isn't good anymore. That's a whole other thing, but it's a shame. I respect Doug Walker for paving the way for a lot of what we see on the internet today. Yeah, he did. He paved the way for us. He showed us like movie reviews are a viable thing on the internet to make mm -hmm. money off of. Yeah, I can't say I ever watched him before I started my shit. I watched mm -hmm. Red Letter Media yeah, instead. But I believe yeah. Nostalgia Critic was before Red Letter Media Plinket reviews anyway. Absolutely. And it was because of his perhaps blind stubbornness, but also his persistence that he was able to stay on the platform and continue doing what he was doing. <laughs> With his five second movie things, I remember he uploaded them on many different channels. That was the only content I'd actually seen from him back in the day. Mm. Uh, later I found out it was the same person doing Nostalgia Critic and bu bum reviews and all that shit that I wasn't interested in. <laughs> I don't know, the five second yeah, movies was kind of funny. I don't even remember I've never those. been that interested. He did one for The Lion King, it was kind of funny. <laughs> I remember the bum reviews oh. days. And now yeah. they're over. Oh, well. In terms of content, I can't really say that uh, any or sorry, most channel awesome uh, creators appeal to me in any way. Yeah. It's just, mm. it's all the same, you know, not all of it, because mm -hmm. I mean, technically Chris Stuckman is or was on the, on the website as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, that was the thing too. Everyone on the site had to fit their mold. And so they all, it all kind of produced a very similar style and it became annoying. And oh, yeah. It was stale, which is another thing that killed the whole site. Yeah, I mean, it was it was one of those things where you could literally remove a dozen of them from the website and no one would even notice they're gone, <laughs> you know, because <Exactly. laughs> like, they're all making yeah. the exact same videos with the exact same cutaway skits with the exact exactly. same quality, the exact same fucking yeah. camera, the exact same lighting. You know, that was the uh -huh. only thing that really bothered me about uh, Nostalgia Critics videos for a long time. I was like, wow, you're doing this for a living. You've got tons of money. The audio. You've, you've, you've spent like, what, $200,000 on that studio for the supervillain shuffle. And you're still mm -hmm. using like a shitty handy cam, no lighting. The mic is, is built into the camera. Like you, there are all these things that, <laughs> that you have the money to be able to produce something better. And for some reason, you you either don't know that there is a better option available or you don't give a shit. And that really bothered me in terms of content. I yeah, same. I felt the it's same. It's a mix of both. And me being critical of, of films, I feel like it's only fair to extend that same criticism to YouTubers because I believe that YouTube is as legitimate of an art form as television or films. It really just has much more variety in terms of quality. Mm -hmm. It's just way more of it, isn't there? Yeah. So there's going to be yeah. more. Anybody can upload. But yeah, I feel Anybody. I feel like it's important to be critical, especially of larger YouTubers in terms of their presentation and style and content overall. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right. That's fair. Well, rest in peace. <laughs> we can get off the, this dumpster fire if you don't. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. yeah no, no this hard is, feelings. This is sad. I didn't even want to bring this up, really. This is yeah. Your idea, I felt Ralph. like I should have, you know. Yeah. Especially since I I loved them when I was a kid. Yeah. And it just pains me to see. Sorry. That's a good lesson for you, Ralph. Everything yeah. you love dies eventually. Uh huh. Don't look up to anyone. Don't <laughs> be mad at me. Either be revealed to be a creepy Hollywood pedophile or like <laughs> an incompetent mm -hmm. businessman. <laughs> Oh, Kevin Spacey, one of my favorite actors. Yeah, he was one of mine oh, too. Yeah. Do we want to get on to something more cheerful? Yeah, I just want to, uh, well, I actually, <laughs> we have another topic that's not really that cheerful, but uh, oh, this great. is Sardonicast, so it doesn't really matter. I just wanted to that's say true. to end, end uh, the Nostalgia Critic subject, don't be mad at me, Malcolm, I'm sorry. Who's Malcolm? He's a, uh, he's the guy who starred in the Supervillain Shuffle who is uh, also a furry 
and then I see at conventions. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we talk. Hey, you're furry buddies. Yeah, okay. he's a tiger. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Uh, wow. Yeah, he's he's open about it. I didn't just uh, leak. I didn't just dox yeah. or anything. So I, I, I figured you wouldn't do that to the the poor guy. Yeah. Go ahead. We got another subject here. Shoot. As we're recording this right now, there is a uh, congressional hearing for Mark Zuckerberg, the Zuckster. <laughs> uh, what do we think about Facebook in general? <laughs> <laughs> Who the fuck uses Facebook? Who? Old we people. Do, apparently. We all have Facebook pages. Yeah. I'm thinking of deleting it, honestly, after everything that's come out. Yeah, how often Elon do you Musk go on Facebook? That? Never. Yeah, never. I haven't gone on it since like 2012. I'm on mm -hmm. Facebook to respond to messages that are sent to me by my friends because there's a certain portion of my friends that use Facebook. They all seem to be of the same relative political leaning. Oh, okay. And then my family, really? uh, who, I mean, it's just easier to use Facebook for messaging with my family because they all use dumb Apple phones. And so if they that try to sense. group message me, then I have to like download the messages individually on text because they're all dumb iMessage file things that are yeah. only compatible with other iPhones unless you download them the same way you're downloading like a picture attack okay. attachment. So that's kind of annoying. So I I just tell them to group message me on Facebook instead, and it's it's easy. And then in terms of like yeah, there's probably much better messaging platforms that we could all be using. But I'm there. I'm never gonna be able to convince my family to install and learn a new app like Telegram or something. Like that's that's the issue is that everyone's yeah. on Facebook, so you need to use it too. Not everyone, everyone in my college has a Facebook. Oh everyone. really? So if I want to do anything involving other people, I have to go on Facebook and message them or friend them on Facebook. Oh wow! That's the only reason I have it. Really? Yeah, but it's just I hate it. There's a bit of a gap, like a few years below us, where not as many young people are installing Facebook. Like, Facebook is a shit ton Good. of old people. We're going to actually hit a year where there's more dead people on Facebook than alive Ooh. people. Because there's memorialized accounts, too. We're actually going to hit a point where it's mostly dead people. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. I can't wait. I, I love Twitter <laughs> so much more. So much more than Facebook. I don't know all, why. All I the guess... youngsters use, what, Snapchat? Oh, fuck Snapchat, Snapchat, Snapchat Twitter, Snapchat. Instagram. Those are those um, are the three. I've tried. What's wrong with Snapchat? I'm not the kind of person that that really gives a shit about promoting what I'm doing every second of the day. And quite honestly, oh, of not. it would be pretty boring for people because I'm always fucking editing or working on something. You know, I don't just yeah. go outside and s snap a picture of ice cream or something. Like that's not my life. So. Well, I'm not one of these people that like uses it all the time. I only use it for work mainly, or to take pictures of my dog in the case of Snapchat. Yeah. But like, I I'm not on social media 24 seven. So I get a healthy dose of Twitter. And I'm like, okay, this is fun. Yeah. And then you get to Facebook, and it's everyone's just fucking whining about something that you have no interest in. <laughs> <laughs> all of the uh, social media platforms that I use have their own flaws. I don't have an Instagram because I just don't see the point you know i'm like what what can instagram do that i can't already do on facebook or twitter i can post pictures there if i want you know instagram's just for pictures yeah yeah that's i have one for my I get dog it. <laughs> yeah that's what i have one for my dog and one for myself where i just post pictures of me and my dog and that's it that's funny yeah i have someone I else to run my instagram they just post whatever i put on twitter on it <laughs> yeah yeah that's what sucks it's like everything on my facebook is just stuff i put on twitter that i just copy and paste yeah i feel like a hack i'm like yeah i said this already what the fuck yeah i just I I, i'm not a big uh social media person i actually had to grow into twitter at first i kind of hated it and um yeah, didn't same. really see any point in it and just used it for my business marketing purposes like okay i'm supposed mm -hmm. to have a twitter account but over time i mm -hmm gradually uh learned that i could make really short and really uh upsetting shit posts that i found very fun to uh inflict upon my audience so yeah it's a fun way of sharing like little thoughts or things you discovered yeah That's why I like this, this, the danger is it's quite addictive like i find sure. the longer i spend on social media the more fucking depressed i am so i've been yeah. really trying recently to just not go on it 
really. You know, just now and again, well, maybe a couple times. Do you use times it a, a lot day. for personal use, or just um, like to promote yourself? Well, and look I use at like what WhatsApp just to them. message my friends, but yeah, that's what I use too. Yeah, I I never go on Facebook, or I just check Twitter like a couple times a day now because it's too easy to fall into the oh I got a notification, let's check that, let's see what what people are saying about me. Especially and, with your following, yeah, exactly. It never ends when you're just reading opinions all fucking day. You're never giving your brain a rest if you just, you uh -huh. get four hundred tweets of people like saying half of them are saying how fucking. We can't wait for your next video, and I hope you do it on this or that video sucked, and that one was amazing. What do you think of this movie? I said, yes. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? It's fucking exhausting. It's fucking yeah. exhausting. I just flat yeah. out don't check my notifications. If let's say I am like on a plane and I have Wi-Fi, or if I am like on a road trip or just like in the passenger seat of like a taxi and I have nothing to do or something then perhaps yeah. I will take a small portion out of my day to check those notifications. And I don't want it to seem like I don't give a shit about my fans because I check yeah. Reddit all the time. I feel like that's a more productive way to engage in conversations because it's already curated. It's all The, the community mm -hmm. has already d decided what is more important in terms of questions that can be asked and what is bullshit that should be downvoted or removed. So I know that, it, that <laughs> it's already been filtered in some way. And I can, you know, I can really easily just see like, oh, front page, like there's only so many there that I can be like, yes, I'll respond to this. But in terms of a Twitter timeline, like no fucking w I can't do it. I can't keep up with it. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. There's a lot of questions that people ask that I've already been very clear about. And they clearly just either haven't seen my video or like, why don't you make a review on this? Like all you had to do was just fucking search it up. That's all you had mm -hmm. to do. You had to search it in <laughs> I've YouTube. That so many times. All the, that's all you had to do. <laughs> when you say things like that, though, you sound like an asshole, and you can't you can't help it because I feel the exact same way. There's so many people sending you so many messages about so many different things. You can't fucking handle it. And at first, when you're you know a up a comer YouTuber, every notification you get, you get excited. Mm -hmm. Then there's a point it becomes annoying. You're like, yeah, I just don't want to fucking. I remember with under 100k subs, I would like check every message I got on Facebook, Me too. every every comment. On Twitter, I was like, yeah, yeah every comment. Yeah, I'd go through all of it, and eventually it just gets too much. Yeah, now it's like 50,000 say I'm gay or whatever. I don't think it makes us sound like assholes because if there is some person out there that's like, oh yeah, you should check every one of these. What they're basically asking for is for us not to make videos because like yeah. that <laughs> wouldn't be possible. <laughs> Like, in order to yeah. make the content that you guys like, which is why you're subscribed and why you're following us in the first place, we cannot check all your comments. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. So, call me an asshole, but I don't think that, uh, I don't think it's an assholeish thing to do. One of my favorite things about doing YouTube stuff is, is fan art. It's like my absolute favorite mm, thing. I love that, um, too. But finding it, I find to be quite difficult sometimes, because one of the best ways is through Twitter. A lot of people send you it, but they tag you in yeah. it, and... You have to go scroll through every other type of notification to get to it. So I end up having to look at DeviantArt and Reddit and stuff to try and find them. And I'm sure there are loads that slip through the cracks and I can never favorite or anything, which really sucks. Yeah, that is yeah. really unfortunate. So I will say to uh, anybody in my audience or our combined audience, like the best way to get me to notice something would be through my subreddit. And if you get downvoted to oblivion, then <laughs> I'm sorry, and perhaps maybe you should make <laughs> a better post. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you're right. You're totally right. Yeah, let, the, let your community curate it for you and decide what is important for you to be able to see. Mm -hmm. I think that that makes sense. Yeah, I'll check my Reddit sense. every day. It's the yeah. one that I will maintain and look at. Because it's where, like, the, yeah, you're right. It just filters all the shit out. If something important is happening, that's where it's going to be. Yeah, that's why yeah. I migrated uh, from 4chan to Reddit. <laughs> Once I started using Reddit, <laughs> oh, I didn't gosh. use 4chan anymore. Because I was like, you know yeah. what? You can you can get whatever experience you want on Reddit. You can subscribe to whatever subreddits you want. And yeah. you don't get a bunch of idiots that are... Well, you you do get idiots. You get don't, a different kind of idiot. Don't piss off the 4chan idiot. people. Well, 4chan yeah, people, don't. those are the guys that send fucking... They send bombs to your house. <laughs> Those are the kind of people 4chan people are. <laughs> they'll, they'll swat your fucking house. They're wow. the people who found that, that flag Shia LaBeouf put up in the middle of the desert. And there's like a blue sky <laughs> oh, yeah. in the background. And they're like, they, they like found the fucking stars and mapped it out and found the flag. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons that 4chan has accomplished over the years. And if you're looking oh, for God. a great YouTube channel, 
on uh, those events. There's Internet Historian has some great videos on a lot mm, of those. Yeah, that's a good one. I don't know. Like the whole community of 4chan is just barely existent anymore. Poll still exists, I guess. You know, like there's a lot of people <laughs> that uh, are still there that just hate Reddit. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just I'm happy with my experience that I'm getting on Reddit. I wish that there wasn't as much censorship going on. But at the same time, I mean, censorship has uh, become a huge thing on 4chan as well. A lot of things that uh, were once permitted there are no longer. And uh, Moot doesn't give a shit. He's not even associated with it anymore. And uh, the glory days are over. You know, the Wild West of I the Internet is not a thing anymore. So the theme of this episode is everything we love dies. Yeah, that's the theme everything of uh, Six Feet Under. Wow. And that, yep. Just everything. And Synecdoche, New York. Sardonicast, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Synecdoche, New York, the most depressing fucking movie we've ever made. One of the most. I'm sure there's more depressing movies. But... Oh, actually, I can think of one off the top of my head. Oh. Dear yeah. Zachary is the most depressing oh, movie. Oh, I thought you were going to say Antichrist, no. leading to an excellent segue. But let's, let's talk about Antichrist. <laughs> uh, by the way, do, if you're going to watch Dear Zachary... Guaranteed, you will cry. Perhaps there'll be yeah. some some asshole in the comments that is like, well, I didn't cry, but secretly they did, and they're just trying to build up a manly image of themselves. Mm -hmm. But uh, okay. you will cry. And I'll watch it tonight, and then oh really? <laughs> okay, well don't look <laughs> up anything about myself. it. That's my advice to everybody. Right. So <laughs> that is not our uh, official film recommendation for the next week, but uh, <laughs> that that is something that should be watched by everybody. I think. Anyway, we wanted to talk about uh, certain movies that uh, apparently our audience wants us to fight and bicker about. Ding, ding, ding. There have been posts on our subreddit, and people have said, mm -hmm. I, I want them to fight about these movies. We want them to hate each other. We want to destroy their friendship. <laughs> and yeah. um, I'm all for this it. This is so. boring. Yeah, let's fight. do it. What friendship? <laughs> Fuck both Aww. of you. <laughs> Oh, well, well, what's the one? What's the one you want to talk about first, Adam? Well, Is we did Antichrist? say Antichrist. So yeah, let's, we might as let's well. talk about that. I haven't seen it in a, in a year too. or two, but I yeah, saw it right. recently. I've also seen it recently. Oh, okay. Me for you like the seventh time or something. I'll, I'll be like the ref of this one because I I know the movie, but it's been a while. I obviously so. love the film, but Alex might have. Some yeah, I different saw it the other day, and. Uh, can't really remember anything from it. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't <laughs> engaging to me at all. I thought it was so fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> what? It was Nothing. like because right, I just watched Dancer in the Dark and I was like, "This is fucking awesome." Oh, more. Oh, so you wanted to experience another oh, Von Trier? Okay. I see. Yeah, I wanted to like dive into his other works I haven't seen, and I was like, "Okay, this one's clearly more horror drama focused. Mm. Let's let's see what comes from this." And I was just waiting and waiting for something interesting to happen. And the whole time was just like, well, I guess the intro is really fucking cool. That's, it like yeah. peaks very early on. It's like the best That's bit. absolutely the highlight, is that the, close -up the opening the is beautiful. I think it's one of the best opening scenes of any movie. <laughs> the close-up of the dick. Oh, I, I, I would agree, with, agree you, with you, except the rest of the movie's pretty bad, so. Yeah, it's like, there's such a contrast between that and what it sets up compared to the rest of it, in mm -hmm. my opinion. There, there are a couple of other, like, really memorable shots, like the one in the tree that's on the poster. It, re it really lost me at that point where, like, the fox... <laughs> <laughs> Chaos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I was like... <laughs> By the way, I guess this is a spoiler discussion here. Watch Antichrist if you haven't. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we are yeah, talking so a bit about bored. it. Oh, it's, I love the movie, so just saying that. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, true. I think yeah, that's yeah. amazing. What, what I found really telling was, though, I went into the, the trivia section after, and one of them says, according to Lars von Trier, he tried his best to make a horror film, but he did not succeed. Hmm. And, and that's kind of my biggest problem with it. I, I was trying to figure out, do you want this to be a drama? Would you want this to be scary or or what? what? I was laughing out loud at some points because I thought it was so like ridiculous, like that fox thing. Yeah, that's that would be <laughs> the one point where a lot of people laugh. It's very strange. Yeah, and I, and I rolled my eyes at the part with the uh, the self mutilation as well. Like I was just like, oh, but but why? I don't know. It was just like at, at that point I was so disinterested. Seemed like grotesque for the sake of being grotesque. Yeah, or like shock value kind of thing. Yeah. It just felt meandering to me. Mm hmm. Like at the end of it, I was like, I didn't feel like I'd seen something I hadn't particularly seen before, and I was, I was, just, I was honestly just bored. Okay, it really did not work for me. I'd like to hear what what you really like about it, though. 
Because it's one of those ones where it's easy to just say, oh, you didn't get it. But, um... Well, I, I've seen the movie very many times, and I feel like I get more yeah, out of it every it once, so. every time that I, I watch it. Yeah. There's a lot of um, really cool special details, especially in the opening scene, in the shot where uh, Willem Dafoe like, lifts her ass up and, uh, on the counter, and there are these mm-hmm. little... Um, there's you know those um kind of children's learning little flat wooden boards that have different pieces and shapes that you have to fit in there yeah you can actually see the three beggars in that shot uh being lifted up from the uh the board um as as her butt falls onto it so you see the uh the crow <laughs> the fox and the deer in the opening scene you can actually see um, when the kid is slow mo going down from the cradle, you can see that the shoes placed on the floor are actually uh, in reverse order. Um, and so, like all of these clues of things to come and the themes and um, horrible things that this mother winds up doing can be seen plainly visible in the opening scene. You can also see when in, when the shot focuses on the uh, baby monitor, you can see in the corner that it's actually muted, that th- she did that intentionally. And I love this this kind All of right. very odd and concerning character study almost of this woman who's just so fucking batshit insane that she deludes herself into playing along with this idea that she's not responsible for her child's death and that she's she's a grieving mother and meanwhile i really enjoy the the relationship between her and willem dafoe who kind of plays a bit of an asshole in in one aspect yes he's trying to care for her and yes he's trying to make her confront her own fears but he's also not doing it in a way that's very responsible and he's still dating her he's still having sex with her when he knows he shouldn't and he's trying to control his own urges but not doing a very good job at it. I love the dynamic between very them. Detached to me. Oh yeah, and it, it, in a way, it's kind of supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's intentional. When Von Trier made this film, he was like depressed as shit. He, mm-hmm. he in interviews, he was saying like he was suffering through some of the worst depression in his life, and that was kind of the the jumping off point for making Antichrist, and it really shows in the film. Yeah, it does. Especially, you know, that sequence where Willem Dafoe is describing anxiety and you have each of these visual representations of anxiety as he's describing the symptoms. I love all of the therapy scenes. Like, Antichrist has some of the best cinematography of any movie I've ever seen, quite honestly. Really? Well, yeah, the, like all of the the slow motion shots and just how like, not just like the super high frame rate, but how crisp and and lush but at the same time fearful and undersaturated at some points it's it's this very odd strange mix of emotions and concepts that are present in these shots in order to make something that you know a lot of people might find the outdoors to be a very comforting kind of place to them but he filmed it in such a way where it was very disturbing and off-putting. And I loved the um, just these weird kind of like morphing effects in the trees that as the camera's moving yeah, by, cool. as soon as that starts happening, you're like, did I just see that? You know, like you're not so sure about it. And it's like, I don't know. I, I just, I, I don't really um, see much wrong with the film. Although I will admit the first time that I watched it, I took it a little less seriously. Well, okay. how, how long is the movie? An hour and a half, I think. Let me look it hour up. An hour and a half? I don't think it's very yeah. long. Okay. It is. I was going to say. If it's, it's one if hour it's... 48. Okay, okay. So almost two hours. I don't know how long you can sustain that. I, I, again, I'm just, I was curious because I could see that. The, the way you describe it, Adam, sounds cool. All I remember is thinking what Alex thought, which is, wow, that movie was boring. It looked great. But I didn't give a fuck. I totally understand that perspective. <laughs> yeah. mm. Believe it or not, there's a lot of people that think that I try to like override my own opinions onto others, but I don't really do that. Uh, of course you don't, <laughs> and I you're a kinda, human being. I kind of fucking go <laughs> out of my way to communicate <laughs> yeah. that in like every fucking review yeah. I do. 
Where I'm like, hey guys, no, dude, it's okay if you like it or it's okay if you don't like it. Fuck, I say that every single fucking time, but there's some uh, people who just, I guess, contrarian. ignore that Marvel part movies. of my review and nitpick it. Did, did you find the movie scary? Yeah, very, very disturbing. Well, I, it was a different kind of fear than yeah. what you're used to in a horror film. So, like, the, the, when I watched it uh, most recently, it was about a month ago, and I had some friends visiting from out of town, and they both really like horror movies, and so I'm like, okay, I'm going to show you a bunch of horror movies that you've probably never seen in my collection. I bef Before I played it, I said, this is not like a real regular horror movie. It's a very different kind of fear. And I feel like with so many horror films, especially found footage that we see nowadays, they treat the idea of suspense as just silence or a lack of things Strings. happening, you know, when when the mm -hmm. character's holding the camera in a found footage film and they're just like walking along and it's supposed to be really suspenseful, but if you put that in any other movie it would just seem like boring, you know, and it's mm -hmm. there's nothing to it. Whereas the suspense created in in this film is almost kind of like this this nauseating experimental visuals, you know? Like th this mm -hmm. this whole filmmaking experiment that he did. You look at the special features on this film, there's a lot of shit that he put into this movie that he'd never actually tried before, and so they had to shoot a lot of test footage. And I think that it worked out really amazingly. There's a lot of really ambitious things that he did in terms of the filmmaking itself. And as you guys already know, like I'm huge on presentation over, mm -hmm. over everything, and I feel like the presentation of this film is just mind-blowing when it comes down to especially the cinematography. I'm going to say, in terms of you saying it's disturbing, this is an issue I always have with Lars von Trier. He tries way too hard to be disturbing, and for me, most of the time, it comes off as comical, like like an edgelord. Or I something. don't think he knows what he's doing all the time, for sure. Oh, yeah. And I mentioned that in my uh The uh, scene where review. he beats up, was she beats up Willem Dafoe's dick, right? And then jerks mm -hmm. him off and blood comes out or something? Yeah, that, yeah. Like, I'm there, I'm like, that. That's not. that's just fucking stupid. Yeah, that's, that's I, what I also rolled my eyes there. I mean, yeah. that was disturbing. I don't know if you that, agree. See, I, for me, I was it's just like, that. that's ridiculous. No, I think it's hilarious. Okay. Because <laughs> it's so like, well, because there I don't see a character doing it. I see Lars von Trier because I know this fucking guy from all the movies I've seen from him. <laughs> and he's always trying to do shit like that. And it comes across as like stupid to me, like a Saw movie or something. Doing in, something well, like in a way, I mean that she... Okay, so it's not just, oh, she's a crazy bitch, right? That's not all there is to her character. It's that she, sure. she has convinced herself that all of these forms of, of pleasure that she's seeking, is, you know, it ties into the scene at the beginning where the baby fell out of the window while she was having sex. And, at, you know, at least for the majority of the film, she's pretending that she didn't plan that intentionally. But the entire concept that she plagues her mind with and all, all of these witch burning materials that she's she's reading about the evil of 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 women and therefore the evil of nature and therefore the evil of human nature which is pleasure like she she is convinced in her mind that her sexuality is satan right and so that's why she cuts mm -hmm. off her own clit. It's not just like, ooh, masochism, like, haha, I'm so crazy. And, and that's why she, you know, destroys his fucking junk, too. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it is I connected. Think a way it's not of doing just completely that that isn't random. So, sure, but there's a way of doing it that isn't so comically over the top. I, I, oh, of course. I say, it all, I say this line from Woody Allen all the time. If it bends, it's funny. If, it's, if it breaks, it's not funny. And I apply that to everything. Mm -hmm. But, like, that's, that's a great example. Not, it's not funny, obviously, but... <laughs> It just it goes too far to me. I mean that scene. Yes, it's ridiculous for sure yeah. um, And it's really out there and it's ex incredibly disturbing <laughs> and and fucked up uh, and graphic but That's yeah. part of what makes the film what it is, you know, like I I think that something that von Trier excels at is being such a crazy fuck himself that he's willing to put all these these insane things in his films mm -hmm. that no other director would, you know? Like, you, I can't think of another director that would do something like that unless they were yeah. trying to make some sort of fucking, I don't know, a Serbian film or something. I didn't like that very much. That just... Yeah, that's that, another That wasn't one. a very it's good... Just like, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I what a Serbian film. film is missing compared to Antichrist 
is amazing cinematography and performances you know like yeah. all of the qualities it's that i a better seek made for movie than that. in a film in terms of presentation a serbian film has none of that and is just all shock value and no substance whereas this mm -hmm. is able to still make an artistic film that is incredibly well directed and well shot sure i got you it's a matter of taste oh yeah of course and so i can i can totally understand people hating this movie because everybody looks for something different in a film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't say I hated it. I was just... I could tell and feel what he was trying to go for. And as much as I was trying to enjoy it, it just, just something wasn't working for me. Like, when you sit down and watch a film, all you can really talk about is the feeling it made you feel. And if it made you feel nothing, if it got no response out of you, then... Exactly. What value yeah. does it have to you? All right. It, it just wasn't effective for me either. And oh, there's no yeah. subtlety in it for me. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Again, you're like, okay, we got to cut off her clip. And so you both only watched it once, right? Yeah, we yeah. both only. I've seen it. Again, if I see it recently, maybe I'll change my mind. Well, the it, problem is after just watching it, it um, <laughs> the things you're saying made me want to watch it again. But then I remember, oh, man, I have to sit through that bit again. This... Why would you want to? Yeah. How about you give it a couple years and then go back to it? Yeah. I'm not the type of That's person there. to be like... Oh yeah, you just have to watch it again until you get it, because maybe it, you know, you'll mm -hmm. feel the same way. And it's not really about getting it, you know, it's about experiencing something more out of it, I guess. Uh, yeah. Ralph, I, I would recommend to you to to check it out at some point mm -hmm. in the future. People are very they're very stubborn about that. Like, oh, I have my opinion on the movie. Don't force me to change it and watch it again. But it's like some movies you should watch again and. And you know, you'll, you'll yeah, you don't have to as you grow older, or like I hated 2001 the first time. I oh, saw really? It, and now it's like one of my favorite fucking yeah, movies same. ever. Yeah, yeah, I immediately loved yeah. it. I was drunk out of my mind by myself in my <laughs> That's room. That's why <laughs> I, I was like count. 15. I'm like, what the hell is this? I hear this is the greatest sci fi movie ever. But you know, when you're older, you appreciate slower pacing and subtlety. exactly. Yeah, I think I was 15 too. Yeah? I don't know. <laughs> All right, so you're smarter than me, you fuck. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I was just making a joke because I said I was drunk out of you... my mind, but I was probably more like <laughs> oh, 17. Okay, there you go. You contrarian, pretentious film critic. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people don't understand when I'm making jokes and think I'm just being an asshole all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I think no matter what I say, I'm an asshole to some people. Oh, voice uh -huh. crack. Some people. Some people. Uh -huh. Any last thoughts on Antichrist? You too? Uh, all I'd say is despite how I feel about it, I still think it's a movie you should watch because there is a awesome. lot to like mm. about it. Okay, great. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, recommendation from Alex if you weren't already sold on the <laughs> uh, graphic uh, genital mutilation we talked about. I will say one thing, Alex, if you're looking for a Von Trier experience that's closer to Dancer in the Dark, uh, try mm. watching Breaking the Waves. That's a good okay. one. I, I enjoyed that okay. one very much. So it's very different. I mean, Dancer in the Dark is a you know one of a kind movie. So, but it's the yeah, it's one of the closer ones that Von Trier has made. I think awesome. Okay, right. there was another film that uh, everybody wanted us to argue about, mm. <laughs> or at least I don't know if you've seen it, Alex. Uh, I love yep, dogs. He saw it. Oh, you did. Mm -hmm. I love dogs. Oh, I know I you love do. Dogs too. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> uh, Ralph made a video and I watched the first half of it. <gasps> How dare you? You clicked off it because he was so angry. Well, because I wanted oh to God. hear your thoughts on the podcast anyway. Um, oh, okay. And uh, I gave Isle of Dogs a 9 out of 10. Uh, so far, what I noticed is the contrasting opinions in, in uh, the writing. I said that the writing was great. I said that it was a well-written mm -hmm. film and you had some issues with the writing. I had quite a few issues with the writing. Alex, how do you feel about the film uh, overall? I absolutely loved it. I thought it was mm -hmm. excellent. Oh, okay. So unique. Yeah, I thought it was brilliant. Good. Are you familiar uh, with much Wes Anderson material? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a few months ago, I rewatched um, Fantastic Mr. Fox in oh, preparation yeah. for this movie to see how awesome. it would compare. And I, I liked it even more than, than that movie. How far back oh, okay. uh, have you seen Wes Anderson films? Many years. Yeah, mm -hmm. years ago. Okay. Yeah. Great. I've seen a bunch of his movies. I mean, yeah. I really like him personally, but let's let's go into the details more. Yes. I I think he's a great director. I prefer his newer material to his older material, although I haven't seen every one of his older films. I love the uh, Life Aquatic. Mix. I liked Bottle Rocket from what I can remember, but I just it didn't really affect me as much. Darjeeling Limited, I thought was decent. Uh it'll 
probably be somewhere on my 2007 list. And then I haven't seen Royal Tenenbaums, which everybody says is amazing. So, um, And then I've seen all of his newer movies, like everything from, I don't know, 2007 until now. And mm. I've thoroughly okay. enjoyed. I've seen everything except uh, Royal Tenenbaums. Oh, shit. So, oh, Alex, yeah. have you seen the Royal Tenenbaums? No, I haven't. Oh, wow. It's yeah, too so far that's the one we can't discuss. None of us have. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. That might be a good film recommendation. <laughs> Everybody's going to be mad at us. They're going to be like, you call yourselves film critics. You haven't seen this movie Ugh, that I think whatever. that you should have hey, seen before being one. a film critic. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sometimes you miss one. What are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, I've seen everything else. I love Rushmore. I think some of his movies oh, yeah, are fucking seen that one just either. amazing. Uh, Rushmore, uh, Grand Budapest, and Moonrise Kingdom. Those, I think those three movies are like almost perfect. Okay. I love all three of those. And then Life Aquatic is a giant piece of shit, but we can talk about that another day. A lot of people that uh, watched your video, I guess, I guess came away with the perspective that you didn't like Isle of Dogs. And yet, when you were talking to Anthony Fantano after we ended the podcast, you said that you really liked the movie. It it looks great. The animation's Mm -hmm. great. Um, The world he created, this, you know... They take all the dogs and put them on an island, and all the dogs live on their little island. I thought that was all fantastic. You know, I think the the dynamic between the boy and the dog was cute, and mm-hmm. I love dogs myself. So seeing that, like, I was like, this is the most adorable thing. Yeah, you have an Instagram for your fucking dog. <laughs> of course, this, it's the most adorable thing. I just loved. I mean, because the dog and the kid can't stand each other at first, and then he. The kid gives him a little pet, and the dog loves it. I'm like, that's just that's just the <laughs> sweetest thing. Mm-hmm. The problem is Wes Anderson is fucking annoying. Oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. This is what I want to hear. <laughs> I just think he's annoying. I think his style is irritating, and I mm. hate when directors let their style get in the way of the movie, and it makes the movie worse as a result. And they're like, so you I think it's style over substance? On. Well, it's a very hollow. St- a story and a very shallow movie like it has nothing deeper to say which is fine it doesn't need to say anything but he does it in like this i'm an artist kind of way hmm. and i just there's something about his style i find so annoying and he's been doing the same shit his entire career and i'm just tired of seeing the same characters given the same dialogue and him shooting everything the exact same way and i you know that's how i feel about it would you therefore extend those same criticisms to Quentin Tarantino? I would. Yeah? I think Tarantino changes it up. I think the last great movie Tarantino made was Inglorious Bastards, and that's because it's a World War II movie hmm. that has like maybe eight scenes in it, right? And they each go on for 20 minutes. So it was a great yeah. change of pace. Oh, you didn't like uh, the uh, Hateful Eight? I like Hateful Eight. And I, I love Django. But I thought again, it was better it's all than like... Inglorious Bastards. Really? Yeah. I mean, Inglorious Bastards does does end with that same bloodbath like it always does. But I just, it's like, yeah, it's Sam Jackson in the in a shack. It's all the same actors and all the same characters just shooting shooting each other. It's like, yeah, it's the same shit again. And Django's the same thing. And it it was amazing when you see these directors early on in their career, like Pulp Fiction or the Wes Anderson movies I saw at first were Moonrise Kingdom and Rushmore. I'm like, wow, these guys have such an interesting vision. And then you see their whole portfolio, and it's all the same fucking tricks. They have this, these bag of tricks that they keep reusing, and it's like, why don't you grow as a filmmaker? It's, uh, it doesn't impress me. What? It doesn't impress me. Wes Anderson hasn't yeah. grown as a filmmaker? Is that the implication? No, well, like, what are you talking his, about? His movie, his movies all look great because he keeps framing everything exactly the same. And it's like, yeah, he's a master of set design and colors and moving the camera because he keeps doing the same thing every time. And I prefer... Directors like, I don't know, a Nolan or a Kubrick who take their bag of tricks and change it and use it to make different genres of film and challenge themselves. I mean, yes. you could, yeah. I, that's well, how I feel. I mean, like, you could argue that Nolan is the same bag of tricks in many ways, but yeah. what well, yeah, I. But at least he's. He takes his bag of tricks and tries to push filmmaking in a different direction. Like the stuff he did on Interstellar, the the script is, is fucking almost dog shit. So for I, Interstellar. I mean, like, <laughs> let's not discuss. But like the the he got like fucking astrophysicists to to study black holes and write whole papers just sure. just so he can make a black hole realistic in his movie. How much more out of your element would you want Wes Anderson to be? He he completely filmed in a different medium. He's adopted stop-motion animation 
this late in his career. Mm -hmm. Like this is a new thing for him. So I don't know what what kind of expectation. Yeah, that's that's one film, (laughs) right? And now this is his second. And even you yourself pointed out in your video that the animation and overall aesthetic of the film is much more improved in the in this film. Uh, from Fantastic yeah, sure. Mr. Fox. It was, it was so great. to claim he's not like growing as a filmmaker or even changing things up is, I feel, not very accurate. All right, I'll give you in a visual sense. He, he has the same general style. Like he 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 loves symmetry. He loves still shots. Or if he's going to have movement in his shots, it's going to be very precise and almost mechanical. And I love how he's translated that across different mediums from stop motion mm-hmm. to live action and back. And what's crazy about it is like it, he's he's taken from both of those. It's not like he just had live action filmed in a certain way and then created stop motion and adopted it to that and then learned nothing from that and continued on. There's a lot of shots that he used for the the first time in Fantastic Mr. Fox that that you can then see represented in Moonrise Kingdom. So it's almost as if him working on a smaller scale allowed him to fine-tune a lot of movements that he wound up bringing into a larger scale in real life. And I, I, I've i seen him grow with every film he makes. And so, I, I, I mean, like, yeah, he is the same style. Like, he has a style like Quentin Tarantino does, you know, in, in the yeah. same sense that he prefers this kind of Wes Anderson universe that he wants to tell this story in. And that's the movie he wants to make. And, mm-hmm. you know, in in the same way that musical artists have the same style, you know, it's like what what you're trying to get out of Wes Anderson would be like, eh, why doesn't 50 Cent make a country song? You know, like <laughs> people have their style. <laughs> That's, well, v- in a visual sense, it doesn't bother me as much, even though I see all those tricks that he does all the time. I'm like, yep, that's that same kind of shot he does in this. Fine. I'll, I'll forgive it. It's more the writing and the characters and the dialogue and the stories he tells every time. And it's not like it's not like he can't tell those stories, but he has to find new ways of telling it because now I just see I, I just see it when I watch it. I'm like, yep, he's doing this thing again. It's this character again, except this time it's a girl instead of a boy. And this time it's, you know, it's just it's annoying because I've seen all of them. Well, all the monotone dialogue, you, you loved the dialogue. You thought it was funny. I didn't. Yeah. So you talk about the I dialogue. I thought it was really humorous, yeah. Would you... Um, yeah, all right. You, you two talk about that for a bit, because I'm curious. Would you... Can uh, I know that you have an issue with a lot of the characters sounding and talking very similarly. And although mm-hmm. this has been a somewhat constant uh, aspect to Wes Anderson films and the Wes Anderson extended universe and just how he likes to present things in his films... Would you consider it to be an unfair point to make if I suggested that it actually fit better for this film because all of the dog characters are presented in a way where Chief is the outsider. He is the non-pampered one. He is the one that actually has a very different character and the rest of them blend in, as you've mentioned. But that fits in line with the characters and the themes of the film about how they're all pampered and, and how they they weren't strays and how they don't have this sense of individuality and they immediately flock to the kid and look for a sense of guidance, whereas Chief doesn't. Do you not feel as though that fits better for this film? No, because all the people talk like that too. <laughs> it's just this. All the people in that movie annoying... are Japanese, though. <laughs> um, not, for the, the not the girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The main, yeah, the main girl talked in that same like, oh, I'm going to talk like this too. I mean, I get what you're saying, but I don't know. Let, let me let me get back to you on that. That is a good point. I f- I feel like when Wes Anderson wants to kind of shine a light on a character, it almost helps to have every other character being somewhat along the same mold, you know, because then the really eccentric ones, the really different ones stand out even more. I'm willing to believe that it's it's an intentional part of his style. It seems to be. It's not like he can't write characters that are outside of that mold, because he does, you know. He's proven that he understands how to do it. So I, I don't see any other um, explanation for these characters all kind of talking and acting and you know more or less having the same pacing i can't see any other explanation other than it's his intentional choice and he prefers 
for his films to be like that. I don't really consider it to be a flaw. Well, it's 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 clearly an intentional choice, but it's a choice I don't like. So it comes down it's, to preference, is what you're saying. Yes, it comes yeah. down to preference, yeah. that too. And then, again, it's just in all of his movies. And it, at first, I'm I, when I thought when I saw Moonrise Kingdom, I thought it was adorable how the kids talked monotone. And then you watch all of his movies, and you're like, okay, you, it's the same mo monotone characters delivering the same kind of snappy, kind of sarcastic dialogue. Mm -hmm. And it, it gets annoying to me. And even in Isle of Dogs, what you said, that's a good point about how it separates Chief from everybody else. But it's when you're watching the movie, you're just like, fuck, man. Can't you oh, just well. find a different way of doing the same thing? When you're you watching the like movie, it. you mean. Yeah, when, I'm, you when mean. I'm watching the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alex, what do you yeah, have to add? I, um, I've got a little anecdote for you. Go for it's it. Bit, it's All a bit right. upsetting. Perfect. Uh, so right before the movie began, right, I was sat in the theater and a, a trailer mm -hmm. played for what looks like to to be an excellent film that's coming out. What's it called? <laughs> Nomeo and Juliet. Uh, uh, fucking really? They played kids movie trailers in your yeah, Isle of Dogs yeah, yeah. showing. I found this that's very interesting. interesting. Uh, wow. Um, mm -hmm. What's it called again? It's the like uh, Sherlock Gnomes. Oh thing. yeah, <laughs> that was playing. Yeah, you know, there's a bit in that trailer where a gnome starts twerking, right? I I wouldn't know. I I've never seen well, that this happens, trailer. <laughs> that happens, and um, the yep. the audience was was in tears. They were loving oh, it. Oh no! They were, <laughs> <laughs> they were they were <laughs> clapping. They were just absolutely loving it. Then oh, the film yeah. began. Oh no! And through the entire thing, not one laugh. Oh no! No no noise at all. Just Man. silence. Um, I had a very different experience. That that upset me. That upset me quite a lot. Um, oh, that is upsetting. I was I felt embarrassed about like laughing in 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 the movie because of like everyone else just being like, mm. and I, I looked on the on the reviews of the the cinema that I go to, and someone had left a review saying something like, like a one star review saying, absolutely terrible. I took my two kids to see this and they were bored uh. out of their minds. Uh, stuff like that. Yeah, it's not a kids but, movie. <laughs> fuck it's, off. It's not a kids <laughs> movie at all. Like it, not it's even being marketed bit. as one. Here. Oh, they're, they're, that's they're, they're unfortunate. Trying oh, okay. They're trying oh my to sell God. it as one of those like wacky uh, movies oh, about talking animals. Um, oh, jeez. So there, is there like I, a I UK trailer that we should watch that we should include in the description um, or something? Oh my God, yeah. I don't know if there is one. Okay, but, um, I'll try to find it. If there is, it was just it, it was just kids movie trailers before it. Yeah. Um, All right. You know what? I, I I was seeing it somewhat as a. Uh, an audience aimed well, aimed at a younger audience, to be honest, be because of that. Um, despite the fact that like there are, there's kind of violence in it, I don't know if we're, if there's spoilers being talked about now. Are we talking oh, no. spoilers? It's a violent you can movie. see it's the PG dog's 13. ear getting ripped off in like a web clip they posted. Yeah, it's so. like right at the beginning, and they're just yeah. it doesn't treat the audience like morons, you know. Like the, mm -hmm. a, a lesser film would would. Uh, with the Japanese characters, like uh, either dub them doing English voices or, you know, there's enough where you have to do a little bit on your own, like read something, you know, yeah. or actually look around the scene. Yeah, I just thought visually it's, it's completely masterful. Just so much detail to look mm -hmm. at. Like I love movies where every single shot, you're not just staring at like a character's eyes. Oh, man. You know, the shots are relatively stationary a lot of the time. So there's just so much to look at. Your eyes are just going all around the screen. It's great. If there's one word to describe Wes, Wes Anderson, it would be quirky. And I, I'm just surprised that it's only now that the quirkiness is annoying you. Because I kind of go in expecting, yep, this is going to be a quirk fest. That's, that's exactly what I'm going to yeah. get. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, but sometimes it is really annoying. Like Life Aquatic is an incredibly annoying movie because <laughs> of that. What I'm just a little confused about is is what makes one of these movies annoying to you or several of them and the other one's not. It's it's a lot of things. It's the the theme of the movie for one thing. It's who again, like Alex, you said the dialogue would work for a kid's movie, but this isn't a kid's movie. And like all these characters are over explaining everything. And if it was a what? kid's movie, I would somewhat forgive it. Oh yeah, all the time. Characters would literally go like, I feel this way about this person or we have to go here and do this. And well, it's like, I mean who the fuck can't you just put like an actual good line there instead? But... And I know it's his style, but it's just so like I, he keeps doing this the same tricks. He's not making a <laughs> Michael Haneke movie, you know? Is it not framed for younger audiences though? I don't think it's for younger audiences at all. 
I really? Think a kid, any anyone under thirteen would be bored to tears by this. Yeah, I don't think it's for mm. younger audiences. I this, don't think so. In in the same way that you said, like, yeah, they don't dumb it down. Well, kids' movies kind of have yeah. to fucking dumb it down. I think they do because they're for yeah, kids and kids dumb are dumb. It's the kind of thing I would have loved. That was when my I was issue. 10, it's movies 11. for dumb people and children. That's what kids' movies are. I I was looking at it in terms of wow, this is really refreshing for what is being marketed as a kids' movie. Mm. Yeah, it's not though. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting that it was marketed no, as a kids because movie. Because Fantastic so like... Mr. Fox is a kids movie, isn't it? It's based yeah, on a children's book. Yeah, but this book. is this movie's PG-13 in America. It's a PG here. Really? Oh mm -hmm. my god. Which okay. just means parental guidance. I think it might so be here like... too. Actually, I think it's yeah. guaranteed PG because otherwise it would it's, be 14A, which I know it's not. It's PG-13 here. Yeah. In, uh, so, lo America. so loads of kids movies are, are PG. That's why it's it's interesting how it's just com framed completely differently based on the country. Yeah. Um, I guess they think that we're stupider here, or it won't sell here, I don't know. Compared to Fantastic Mr. Fox, which was aimed at children, right? Because it's mm -hmm. based on his children's story. So it, it made sense to me to go into this expecting something somewhat similar to that, looking at the PG rating, and looking at the trailers. It seemed very much to be framed as kind of like a, a more inclusive, you know, not like Grand Budapest Hotel, you know? that That's mm -hmm. clearly not a kid's movie, right? It's it's not yeah. filtered, you know. Even mm -hmm. Fantastic Mr. Fox had the, they say cuss instead of actually swearing and stuff like that. Oh yeah, That's I love that. It, so much of the charm of Grand Budapest is it felt like a kids' movie, even though the subject matter was so dark. Yeah, it was very um, upbeat. Tonal shifts in it. I would argue that uh, children would be more entertained in Grand Budapest than Isle of Dogs. Really? Yeah, you know yeah. what? I think so too. I mean, despite the violence. Well, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of mature themes that would violence, probably though. just go over their heads in the first place. So yeah. I remember there being a lot of sexual stuff in that movie. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, yeah. There, How much there sexual some stuff? Pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty uh, like, Oh yeah, the yeah. older. Uh, yeah, uh, Tilda Swinton yeah. and. Uh, mm. Yeah, I think he, he would fuck older women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a great movie. Uh, I looked it up. It's also uh, PG in Canada. In the Netherlands, it's six, which is <laughs> kind of funny. But PG mm. is like pretty much any age as long as the parents there, so it's the same thing. Do you know what else mm -hmm. I was thinking about though, with it being stop motion in particular? Yeah, which is an art form I really adore as it is. So, oh yeah, anytime we get a new one of these, like I'm, I just really want it to be good, just because they're so visually interesting and unique. But what was that yeah. last one that had Matthew McConaughey as like a bug, and a. <laughs> What the what? fuck was it? Oh, Kubo and the <laughs> Two Kubo Strings. The... Oh, Kubo. That's Kubo, another one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I was, I was thinking about that movie and how it was like, it just had nothing going on, like in comparison with something like this, where there was yeah. careful thought. Great animation, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it had amazing animation, but it, there was just something lacking from it in terms of the style, like mm -hmm. the and the story. Whereas with this, oh, yeah. I just, I just found it engaging from beginning to end, and every time it started to dip, something new happened with be it the story or the visuals or just something unique be it the mm -hmm. structure or anything like that that well, just made it stand out far more than the average animated movie that comes out i think it's really unique in that in that respect mm -hmm. i don't mean to be the downer but did you guys enjoy the subplot with the girl god what was she even doing she was trying to find the file or some shit i enjoyed <laughs> it and i particularly enjoyed it for reasons that i can't explain because it would spoil aspects to the film but it it, yeah. it did add an element of question and it subverted my expectations as to how the conflicts in the film would be resolved. So that's what I felt added to the film. And it also, it didn't really take up a whole lot of screen time at all. Her yeah. scenes were very not all that important to the film, but they did add a level of uh, subversion to my expectations and kept me... Uh, not expecting how things would be resolved. It was definitely uh, my least favorite part of the movie, yeah. for sure. Yeah, but, I can um, agree with that. I, I think the core either. of what made the story great was was the dog island and the relationship between the boy and the dog. And whenever the movie is focused on that, it really works. And anything else I thought was less interesting. Whenever they focused on his uncle or that girl, I was like, this is not where this the meat of this story is. That's not where the heart of this movie is. The heart of this movie is with these two. So... No, nah, and plus she really, I mean, I guess she kind of serves a purpose in the plot, but not really. Like what she does is almost so, 
insignificant. They could have found another way to write it in in like five seconds and it would have worked. In the grand scheme of the film that I cannot explain right now because it would spoil things, she is not insignificant. Yeah. Uh, and I guess I'll yeah. talk to you about that later. she isn't. She does heavily affect the entire course of the film, really. Uh, she really does. Can't, and if can't you can't remember it. why right now, then... <laughs> No, I do remember later. why, but it's so, it's so, like, like, yeah, she discovers a thing. No. And then that thing really... That's not what I'm talking really... about. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll, I'm talking about something we'll, completely we'll different. Into... So Maybe I'll explain it to you show. later. Yeah. What I would like to say, though, is um, this was rated PG in Canada, and it's very interesting that you had that experience in the UK, Alex, because yeah. my experience was the exact opposite. Really? I saw it... The very first available showing I saw it. So it was about 1 p.m. on a Wednesday. Very strange for it to have the first showing at, at that time. But yeah. it was a very small theater, but it was relatively full. I, it might have been packed. I don't, I don't know. I don't think it sold out, but it was pretty full, which is a very rare occurrence for a 1 p.m. show <laughs> yeah. at a movie theater. Everybody that went to see it, was clearly a Wes Anderson fan. People enjoyed the movie and laughed at parts, and everybody, you know, as they were walking out, said that they really enjoyed it. But I live in essentially the city of hipsters and Chinese people, so yeah. Wes Anderson has a decent audience size here. Well, just from the hipsters alone. See, my screening was empty. Oh, wow. Mine too. Wow. Yeah. What time of day did you see it, and what day? Um, It was like... 5 p.m. or something like that. Yeah, Tuesday I, uh, morning for me. Vancouver is probably a pretty uh, huge fan base for Wes Anderson. Yeah. Just I asked, I've asked other people who've seen it, and it was it was pretty empty for them as well. I think they just don't know how to market it in this country. Like they see yeah, the maybe. dogs and they think cute, funny dogs. Everyone like remember that film Cats v Dogs. Everyone remembers that masterpiece <laughs> that that has dogs in it. Let's just sell it like it's one of those fucking movies. There's also a huge art community here. Like almost every movie yeah. gets filmed in yeah. Vancouver, even if it's Amer an American movie, especially American movies, uh, like Deadpool yeah. films here and shit. So, you know, huge booming film industry because of our uh, tax subsidies. And so there's so many people that are working in, in arts that, of course, there's going to be a lot of Wes Anderson heads here. So did you guys have anything else to say about the movie? I think we kind of uh, well, settled our differences and came to the conclusion that it's just personal preference when it comes to his writing style nah. because it is very clearly intentional. Nah, he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is intentional. I just don't like how he does it. And I wish he yeah. would just, he would take the bag of tricks and change it up. You would prefer that he do what he does not want to. Yes, exactly. And that's, it's never going to happen. So that's why I've just accepted it. Like, he has perfected making the same movie he always makes and he does a damn good job and the movie's fucking gorgeous and i did like it i i you know at the end of the day as a movie when you sit down and watch it it's an engaging fun cute movie um and the visual gags are great in terms of visual comedy i thought it was pretty goddamn funny but like script wise it did nothing for me what about you brit bong three out of five um, or something <laughs> as a huge fan of animation i thought it was really refreshing and with the wes anderson touch like i was i was hoping mm -hmm. to see how he'd improve from fantastic mr fox because mm -hmm. that film's extremely unique as well go on the fox searchlight youtube channel and they've been posting a lot of behind the scenes uh featurettes of the animation process it is fucking really? mind-blowing each one of the freckles on her face is like hand painted none of the <laughs> none of the models were 3d printed all of these little hairs in the dogs are like individually plucked See, in there and it's just like yeah. it's so fucking yeah, detailed and insane and honestly i can't think of a stop motion animated film that has better backgrounds than this mm -hmm. uh probably better lighting i can't also think of i can't say animation, animation itself because uh no i would I, mm -hmm. I would have to say the uh romance scene in anomalisa was better animation overall than uh the movement of the dogs in, and other characters in this film. You know, when they're walking along the, the bridge at the top, their legs kind of move a little weird and stuff, whereas, like, a film like Anomalisa, I feel like the actual movements of the characters and their, like, quirks and their realism, I feel, I feel like the animation itself was perfected in, in that oh, movie compared to... that's intentional, that's too. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, Anomalies is clearly going for a much more natural film oh, yeah. for stop motion. It's a very That's human what film, it. despite it being The, the thing I love about Wes Anderson's animation specifically is that it looks like animation. You can see, like, you can mm -hmm. see the fucking little fingerprints of, of, of every animator just making everything. It's mm. like a, there's a real authenticity to it. And, like, with the Kubo movie, yeah, it's good. It, the animation is good, but it's so good. It's like, why isn't this, why isn't it just CGI? Yeah. Wow. Well, it's just like, hot. Yeah, in a way, point, you know, it's so perfect that you're just it becomes too smooth and artificial. And I like yeah. the, the simplicity of the Fantastic Mr. Fox animation. I know it's not simple, but it, you know, it was just filmed at a different frame rate, I think, to give it a different look. You think so? It yeah, I was reading 12. about it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they shoot Kubo in like 24? Uh, I assume so, yeah. Like, it's just more yeah. smooth. They purposefully made Fantastic Mr. Fox look a bit jerky. Yeah, yeah, I love that about. I it. felt like yeah, they so uh, yeah. found a good compromise with Isle of Dogs, because yeah. I remember them talking in the special features of uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox how they really wanted the like f fur to kind of move around between frames, so they purposefully yeah. kind of brushed it up to make it look as though it's like moving. And they actually, yeah. mm -hmm. it seems as though they kind of continued that in this film, but it wasn't as jarring and distracting. And so I, th I feel like they mm -hmm. found a really good compromise and and better perfected the animation in Isle of Dogs. When the film finished, th there wasn't much to complain about for me. Like uh, I, I was just thoroughly entertained, but mm -hmm. I guess the the context to which I sat down to watch it was a little bit different to you guys, I feel. Um, yeah. Especially considering the way it was marketed and, and sold to me. Like even before the film had, start, like had begun with all these shitty kids movie adverts playing, and I'm not, it just seemed so refreshing compared to all that, and I'd highly recommend it. All right. Well, yeah. For you, it was I sold as it. like a as a kids film. I think I would have been more lenient on it. For me, it was sold as you know another Wes Anderson. See, I, film. I, I, I don't oh, give great. kids films like a break just for being kids films. And though. you shouldn't. Oh, like. I do. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. That's like any. You should give Transformers a break. Then Transformers movies are kids films. You can't explore really complicated themes in a kids movie. And you have to simplify characters a bit. Well, a movie kids. isn't just bad because it doesn't explore complicated themes. There's plenty of movies for sure. adults that don't do that, and they're not bad because they don't. Of course. So. Good point, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> it's just with kids' movies, like, it, it, there's a certain mold that is way more prevalent than the variation of what you get in other, like, yeah. audiences. Yeah. You, know? you can make an amazing kids' movie if you really fucking try, and if you don't, allow yourself to get in the mindset of ah fuck it it's for kids so i don't give a shit which is unfortunately what most kids movies do especially in the script writing process whereas something like the lego movie amazing i think mm -hmm. brilliant movie fantastic yeah. movie it's amazing, it's amazing for kids movie. and adults you know you mm -hmm. you yeah. can have both you just have to be talented yeah. and give a shit you know and that's mm -hmm. the issue is that a lot of people just don't give a shit and that's why the new Grinch movie is going to be great. Oh, of course. <laughs> they're, they're really... Did you see that yeah, trailer? Yeah. yeah, I didn't see that. Oh my God, was that fucking horrifying to see. Yeah, yeah let's take this Grinch bad. character and do the complete opposite with what he's supposed to be. Okay. Yeah. Let's completely shit <sighs> on Dr. Seuss's grave. Let's just take out his fucking corpse and shit They already did that with the Lorax anyway. Who cares? Yeah, well, they're going to do it more as if he hasn't Cat been in the hat. Yeah. beaten enough. Yeah, everything. Oh, poor Dr. Seuss. Oh, my mm. God. I wonder if they're just going to start making films out of all of his titles, like One Fish, Two Fish. Like, see how oh, that pop. goes. Just everything. Yeah. Illumination will find a way to make it bad. I mean, <laughs> they're already exhausting every single toy, you know, like Battleship. Mm -hmm. They're exhausting every single video game. We got Rampage coming out. That fucking oh, game where God. you literally just punched buildings as a monkey. And they're that making a movie like, out of that. That looks like What's a the fake rock? trailer before Tropic Thunder. It looks so... Oh, ah, my God. My God. Anyway. It's probably going to be the biggest film of the year as well. Oh, yeah. The Rock's in it. Dude. Yeah. Every yeah. movie he's in makes a shit ton of money except Baywatch. Oh, yeah. It's going to do great. Adam, I wanted to ask you, if Wes Anderson just made a different kind of movie, don't you think that would have been... It would have been more, more interesting? Aren't you getting tired of just... The same framing and the same fucking characters every movie, <laughs> like I am. Maybe at one point in time I will be, uh, but I feel like each mm -hmm. of his films does 
bring something unique to the table. Like I, they are all in the same style, but Isle of Dogs is not the same movie as Life Aquatic. It's not the same movie yeah. as Moonrise Kingdom. It's not the same movie no, as Grand they're, Budapest. But they're more it's adding, the style, they're right? Adding like on there's top more of each other. They're all they are it's, all unique while still staying uniformly in the same style. Right. I don't sure. I don't consider them I, to be I, the same movie, but they are in the same style. And I like his style and I like that he has purpose to it. I like how clinically meticulous it is. It's very punctual. Everything in his films is filled with intent and purpose. And I mm-hmm. really enjoy that. I that's that's part of why I love him is because of his style. I don't feel like I need him to completely subvert our expectations and create something completely different, you know, like fucking Eli Roth is making the house with a clock in its walls. That shitty trailer that looks like it might be a kid's movie um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> with Jack Black. And um, yeah, that's oh, no. that's like a completely have to different that far. But well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I just uh, who knows? Maybe one day we'll see it. Maybe we'll never see it. In my perspective, I don't really know exactly what you want from him, but I am comfortable uh, with him continuing to use the same style and improve himself along the way. If we hit a point where Mm. he has stopped improving himself, then I might feel the same way that you do. But as for every film I've seen from him from the beginning of his career until now, he's been improving himself in every way. He, He hasn't... I, I thought he perfected it like six years ago, but it turns out he hadn't because he keeps finding ways to improve. So Visually, yeah. Story-wise, I, he takes steps backwards and forwards. That's, how I, sure. that's what I think. All right. Okay. I, I, I got to go back to Nolan. Because <laughs> I, I, I can see the people on the fucking Reddit thread like, oh, what a Nolan defender, this fucking normie. But Nolan's a guy, <laughs> Christopher Nolan, the director. Not Xavier Dolan. Yeah, not Xavier hmm. Dolan. <laughs> <laughs> but Christopher Nolan's a guy, he's always just trying new things and seeing how far he can push cinema, you know? And like Dunkirk is like, an, it's almost like an experimental movie where there's no characters and it's just all fucking planes and and vehicles, you know? And it's, I wish I wish more directors would have the courage to use their tricks to make something different and push cinema you know, further. Do you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> I guess. But I'm sick of Chris yeah. Nolan's shit as well. What you are for <laughs> Wes Anderson. That's, yeah, that's you fair. Know, you, one could make the exact same argument you make for Wes Anderson, one could make uh, for Christopher Nolan. I've got a question for you, though. If um, sure. if he gave you a hug, would you call him daddy? Would you call Wes him Anderson daddy, or Christopher daddy Nolan? Nolan? Uh, <laughs> I feel um, like you would. Probably not. Oh, really? I don't think he'd ever give me a hug. He seems like a very serious guy. Even if your head was firmly placed on his belly? <laughs> All right, maybe. You could hear his digestive control. system? I don't know where, what you're getting at with this. Well, that's your fetish, right? <laughs> I thought you had a digestion yeah, sure. fetish. You're a furry. I thought yeah, you were into was... vor. Uh-huh. I don't know all these fucking terms, Adam. I'm not into all the sick shit that you're oh, into. Okay. <laughs> Isle of yeah, vor. Yeah, keep pretending. <laughs> the sequel. <laughs> Jesus. By illumination. Oh my god. Yeah, I'm not into Vore. I'm Jesus. pretty vanilla for furry standards. So we got <laughs> right. uh, movie discussion. Boy! Yes. Boy! It's a movie about boy. Flavor Flav. <laughs> yeah. Called Yeah Flavor Boy! Spoilers? Yeah, this is a spoiler discussion. So if you would like to see this film, please watch it. Because we're going to spoil it in this discussion. There will be a film that we recommend at the end of this podcast that we will talk about in the next episode. If you want to follow along to what we're discussing, then you should also watch that. But that will be recommended at the end. All right, guys. So this movie is called Boy, directed by Taika Waititi. Um, Did your accent he change? He directed Thor. Yeah, it was like a New Zealand accent. You what? No, nothing <laughs> You what? <Nothing> <laughs> You won't now. No, nothing happened. You so won't, mate. Uh... All right, guys. Come on, calm down. So, <laughs> we're talking about a little kid called Boy. He grew up in the in in the coast of New Zealand in the eighties. Loves Michael Jackson. Loves superhero comics. Loves all the great stuff from the eighties. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. <laughs> all right, guys. Let's go watch the movie Boy. 
So, mm. yeah, it's, it's one of those movies where not much happens. Well, actually, a lot happens in terms of, like, characters growing and changing, but it doesn't have a story as much as it's about a boy who doesn't have a dad, but then the dad breaks out of prison and then comes home and digs up their garden to try and find some money. And that's kind of the whole story. But everything around it is what's interesting. What yeah. did we think of Boy, My Boys? Loved it. I enjoyed Loved it. Loved it. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was pretty great out it's amazing alex because you know i have i fucking can't stand children and you mm -hmm. recommended two movies that are just solely <laughs> about children and i loved both of them you not only recommended two movies with children you recommended two movies with young male children who didn't have father figures that were also had had glimpses of like nazi paraphernalia in this movie as well <laughs> he also like gets up, manipulated the, the weird, unintentional Parallels. similarities between this is england and boy yeah yeah um it's, there's even the scene with a machete <laughs> yeah uh -huh. yeah there's actually oh a lot God. of parallels to to a these films very different tones obviously mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's, that's like I mean, manipulation just, i thought this was intentional like, alex because you you i think you did it intentionally to show yeah. us how yeah, a director genius. can take the same story and tell it a different way yeah that's what exactly what i was thinking guys that's exactly what I was doing. Is it? Um, I see your Kiwi accents. Is it? Is it racist to say that some accents are naturally funnier than others? Yeah. No. Sorry, it's not racist. The director of uh, the film "What's Wrong with Apu" would argue that it is very uh -oh. racist, incredibly racist, actually. But I guess it go. It it depends on what you're going for, because this is a New Zealander making films about New Zealand. Or a kiwi, or whatever you call them. Either. Yeah, either. The, the kiwi accent is funny. There's no debate. It is funny. I don't I care think who funny. you are. It makes anything oh, funny. Anything. Yeah. Flight of the Concords works very well because of that. Um, yeah. What we do in the shadows works very well because of that. It has an innocence to it. It is probably, I guess, a little racist to some people. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm Canadian. I think that, that uh, the stereotypical Canadian accent is hilarious. So yeah, people make fun of that. I don't get my panties in a bunch, so whatever. I guess I'm just in a privileged country, so I'm I'm allowed to feel okay it's with an, it. It's an endearing thing. We're not making fun of it to laugh at it. Yeah, yeah. it's it's We're adorable. With it. Yeah, it it doesn't mean that you disrespect the country. It doesn't mean that if there was a person from New Zealand who's crying over their father's grave that we'd be laughing at it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but it it does yeah. well, exemplify and kind of magnify the comedy in a bit i feel yeah you know and perhaps maybe my own personal biases and experience maybe that's something i have to learn and grow from but as far as i'm mm -hmm. concerned i don't really see it as a big issue and uh i think that uh if the people especially the people that are making the comedy films are okay with it and understand that i guess then that's not necessarily a bad thing Adam, it's okay. You're not a racist. Okay. <laughs> Do you guys know how important this film was to uh, New Zealand uh, cinema? No, I don't. It was a huge, huge hit. Was this like his breakout film? I okay. believe so, yeah. Yeah, it was his first big hit. Um, yeah. It was huge in New Zealand. And it was like, every, I think everyone there was really refreshed that it was finally like, yes, we can attach ourselves to something that isn't hobbits and giant eagles <laughs> and the ring. <laughs> oh, that's I think people funny. were very happy about that. And since then, his his career has really just shot up. Yeah, Thor Ragnarok, his best film yet. <laughs> <laughs> and he's doing a war movie and stuff, and he's all sorts of crazy stuff in the pipeline for this yeah. guy. Um, what is your experience this is, watching this, is his best movie. this film? Were, you watched it while you were living in New Zealand, and how long did you live there for? No, no, no. I was born no. there, and oh, okay. I was only there till I was three. Then I lived oh, okay. on an island off the coast of England. So you didn't catch the funny accent? No. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> you caught a different no, funny was, accent. I, I did when I was three. Um, <laughs> I did have it, but then it morphed into just boring English man. Um, I, if mm. I go back and live there for a bit, you, I, 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 I visited there once for a month, and I had it by the end of that month. So it, it doesn't take very long to get. So I saw it a couple of years ago now for the first time. Yeah, it would have been in 2014 because I saw What We Do in the Shadows. I think one of my relatives told me about it mm -hmm. from then i just went through his entire library i haven't seen the one that's like bird eagle 
shark. Oh, or eagle whatever. versus eagle shark. Eagle versus shark. Yeah, I haven't seen that I haven't yet. Seen either, that. But That's the only one I haven't seen. It looks but, pretty good. Um, I like Jermaine. Oh yeah, yeah, he's really Jemaine funny. Clements he's really funny in What You Do in the Shadows as well. Oh but, yeah, um, he's great. He's awesome. I love yeah. the music that he makes too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I didn't even know he made music. He did the uh, Goodbye that. Moon Man song from Rick and Morty. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh my he's god. The, he voices that thing. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, huh. okay. Have you ever seen Flight of the Concords? I haven't. No. Oh, you should check I it know out. I love the guy. I've seen yeah, a bunch of episodes. Should. I've been meaning to rewatch it. Yeah, it's only two yeah. seasons long. It's great. Taika Waititi directed something like four episodes of yeah. that show. I know he was uh, yeah. involved in that, so. Uh, and he's in it, right? Uh, Taika I wouldn't Waititi? know. I uh, okay. don't remember. I'm not. I forget what he looks like. Was he in? He wasn't in Boy. He's was in he? Boy though. Was he the dad? He's the dad. Okay, that's what I thought. I looked at him. I was like, "Is that?" And then I forgot to check after the fact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're like familiar with New Zealand, right, Alex? Yeah. Very. So you can. Well, my you dad's. Can, yeah, I'm, from I'm gonna there. ask you. Does everyone there just have like horrible fashion sense? Because, oh, it was like, set in everyone, the 80s. It was set in the 80s. Right? That too, but it was like. The kid was wearing long pants and it jean shorts. It was kind shorts. of like, yeah. I don't know if that's a fucking thing. I was like, well, who puts that on a human being? I like how that's another parallel right there, by the way. Chances are the, the only shows they had were like garbage. They were really like garbage, the worst shit they had on TV. Yeah, and it was like, horrible. They, they were all inspired by that, probably. What kind of country of degenerates dresses in like long pants and jean shorts at the same time? Yeah. Now we're yeah. getting racist. <laughs> Way to go, Ralph. <laughs> no. Really bringing it home with the American vibe. Yeah, dude. The the main kid's eyes were like red. I was just noticing just how like <laughs> ugly people what? were in it. <laughs> Jesus, oh, Ralph. <laughs> what is wrong with you? No, it's not because they're from New Zealand. It's just like the main oh, kid, his eyes okay. were like fucking red. Like he had crack or something. Oh, I thought you were joking. <laughs> oh my god, you serious? I yeah. didn't. Uh, you didn't I have did. red eyes. What the fuck are you talking about? I mean, yeah, dude, I in didn't... the start of the movie, the kid had red eyes. I think perhaps you need to change the color settings on your television. Or we'll get no, glasses. Dude. <laughs> dude, the main kid. I gotta look up a picture of him at the beginning. I'll make it the thumbnail. <laughs> you'll, you'll see. You'll <laughs> yeah. see what I'm talking about. You should just Photoshop it, like some yes. of those thumbnails between the kid's eyes and his his jean shorts and the long pants on. I was like, oh my god, why is this kid dressed like this? But yeah, you know, the main kid um, was only hired to something like a week away from filming because awesome. they had someone lined up and uh, it just wasn't working out. And I think he was like an extra or something. And they're just like, you. Yeah. Now you're the lead. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, he was excellent. Yeah, he was great. He was excellent. Yeah. Yeah, he was very good. I mean, beside his eyes. <laughs> the whole film had a very great sense of humor, I think. Oh, yeah. Yes. It's hilarious. Because without it, it would be very dour. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's a pretty depressing situation that the kid is in. Yeah. It would be, this is England. Humor. It would be as dour as that. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's done with as, such, but... like, yeah, just about. It's done, with, mm. it's done through the eyes of a child. So everything's like... Yeah, the color palette was interesting because they shot it on film, so it had like this grainy, dark, mm -hmm. ugly look to it. But all the production design was colorful, so it was like this interesting contrast. And I didn't think Taika Waititi was capable of that because <laughs> I like his movies, but this movie was like brilliant in almost every department. I think it was very quirky and creative in ways. I liked the uh, hand-drawn little animation like sequences things. of the brother yeah. and his For powers his and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it did a really good job at, at capturing the innocence of a child in, in a sense, not just with the brother character, but also how, you know, for throughout the whole first few scenes in the film, Boy is pretty much just making shit up as he goes along in terms of what he tells his brother and what he tells his friends. You know, he's yeah. living kind of in this fantasy land of his own and he practices in his own kind of escapism because he's you know unsatisfied with how things are going in his life and the bullies at school and how he has to feed all of his siblings and cousins and i i thought i thought mm -hmm. that they did a really great job at capturing innocence of children i guess i mean the film literally totally. starts with an et quote doesn't it yeah <laughs> so it yeah that was great too sets the scene it's, it's a scene wonderfully. The script is just great. Everything comes back. Everything has a purpose and a reason to be there. Even the kids' like visions, the, the cartoon drawings. Yeah, they're set up like early on. So it's, in any other movie, they would just throw that shit in there. But they set yeah. it up early on, and it mm -hmm. keeps recurring, and there's little jokes done with it constantly. They get like as much mileage out of that as they can. Yeah. 
It's just stuff like that was so it was so well done. Yeah. There was this nice little kind of subtle detail that I liked where um when boy is getting dragged away by his teacher, it shows it doesn't just show him getting dragged away outside, it shows his brother in his own class in a scene that we don't really see for the rest of the film, mm-hmm. where the teacher's saying, Simon says, touch your nose. And it's just this short moment where it builds and expands to the world and you believe, you know, you don't see the beginning of his scene, you don't see the end of his scene, you just see a shot. And so it creates this illusion that the scene with his brother in the classroom is continuing even when we're not seeing it. It started yeah. before we, yeah. we we saw it in the film and it, and it keeps going beyond uh, when it cuts away. And I, I like those little extra details to help give the world a bigger sense that things are happening mm-hmm. even if they're not being focused on that his brother has his own life and his own class and just that you know it might have even just been for the sake of comedy that he saw him out the window but i think it 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 helped create the illusion that the world is bigger than what we saw on screen mm-hmm. i completely agree with you they did everything they could i like how a lot of the film um could easily fall flat on its face but mm-hmm. right before it does it's always like nope that's there for a purpose those was set up for that. Characters are learning things and changing. Alex, mm-hmm. does everybody in New Zealand call each other an egg? Like, what is that about? <laughs> no, I think that's just a Taika Waititi thing. Oh, yeah? I it think it's hard. just a word that sounds funny because you have to say it like, Ig. Ig. You're an Ig. You're an egg. Ig. Ig. You're an Ig. It was hard to distinguish between the New Zealand quirkiness and the Taika Waititi quirkiness. Yeah, <laughs> Ralph, it is a quirky country. <laughs> Did you yes. watch this film with subtitles? I was about to ask. No, that. I didn't. No. Really interesting. And Did at first, Adam? I was thinking maybe I should, but no. I, and it was it was fine. Nice. Did you add it? Oh, I did. I watch a lot of movies with uh. subtitles. <laughs> oh, right. I like I I I watch movies even in accents that I do understand with subtitles. So, oh, right. there were okay. times I couldn't understand, but that was more because the kid was mumbling than yeah. you know. I feel like I get more accent, out of a film with subtitles usually. So. Really? No, I get less because I, yeah, I find it distracting. Not the, oh, not I don't find visuals. it distracting at all. I watch a lot of foreign films too, so I don't. I don't yeah, maybe I'm just I mean, conditioned that film, way. You gotta. Well, yeah, I don't find it distracting in the slightest. In the same mm-hmm. way that reading a book, you don't find the words distracting. You know. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. I well, what what are some things you guys weren't so hot on? <laughs> Nothing. 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 I felt as though <laughs> there was an element of the film that was kind of glossed over. What's that? The film tried to express this sort of corruption of innocence and the way that they communicated that the most was by showing the boy character not preparing proper meals for his sibling and cousins. And I felt like I would have wanted more out of their relationship dynamic and I felt like perhaps it was only done that way because the rest of the kids couldn't act. I don't know. Probably, but I, I think it's more I, to do with the the films about boy and his dad. That's like no, no, I, I get that, all. but then why show it at all? It it kind of just felt you know thrown in in terms of their entire relationship is summed up just by this quick shot of him, you know, pouring milk and sugar and bread in a bowl, and then we forget about those characters until you know twenty minutes later where he does the same thing again. That's why I like that, because it was just a little... Because that's not what the movie's about, but they still give you some insight as to that relationship. Like, oh, here's a little thing. You got that info? Good. Now we're going to move on with the story. I love little details like that. I get... Uh, I wouldn't really call it a detail. Well, yeah, but... <laughs> what's a better word for it? Oh, whatever. I felt like by the end of the film, like you kind of pointed out earlier, Alex, there's not a lot that happens in this movie. I felt like I kind of wanted more out of it yeah i didn't really feel like much happened in the film i f- and and honestly if we're talking about the overall progression of sequence of events i didn't really feel like i was shown something any you know anything exemplary in terms of not having seen that kind of story or relationship dynamic before it felt all very familiar i liked the style mm. a lot i liked the humor a lot by the end of the film I didn't really feel like I got the experience that I would like to have gotten out of a movie. And I think this is partially due to my personal preference in terms of somewhat tone. I'm not like mm. a huge fan of 
really easygoing, lighthearted films. I, I would prefer for something to give me more of an experience. Yeah. Whereas this was more or less just coasting. They were on the coast. Yeah, we're coasting mm, through the movie, nice. <laughs> and I wasn't shown anything particularly challenging or super interesting, in in my opinion. And I enjoyed the film overall. It's something that I would recommend, but I would prefer What We Do in the Shadows as a Taika Waititi wow, film really? to this one. I felt like What We Do in the Shadows was more special and unique and pushed boundaries more. It was funnier. I enjoyed the humor more in that film. The acting, the story, it went in directions that, you know, had me uh, surprised and was overall just very uh, fun and entertaining to watch. This one I felt like, yeah, that was fun, you know, whereas What We Do in the Shadows, that was fun, you know. Mm. Okay. It's What We Do in the Shadows is a flat out comedy, and I think the dramatic elements in this don't work as well as um... the... As the the comedic elements, I wouldn't call no, what we do in the shadows just like a straightforward comedy. If that's what you're getting at, it's a very well, what we do in the a, shadows. I'd is say it's just a mockumentary, more unconventional <laughs> than than boy. Boy is a very crowd pleasing kind of kind of film. This is a movie where I could I can tell you, Garen fucking Teed, my mom would love it. In fact. <laughs> Every, everyone's mom would love yeah, it. Yeah, everyone's this is, mom would love I it. I mean, I'm not trying to shit on it or anything, but this is a mom movie. This is definitely a mom movie, if anybody mm -hmm. knows what I mean by that. It's very calming. It's, it's, it's only controversial enough to be shown and not offend moms, you know? Like, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. very um, safe. It's very crowd-pleasing, very inoffensive. I would agree it's a really well-made, good, maybe great film uh, that I would recommend to people, but that's not really the type of experience that I'm looking for in a movie. What did okay. you give it on your um, your rating scale out of curiosity? I would give it a seven. I would give it a, a seven, seven for sure. Okay, yeah. okay. You're making it sound lower than that, so that's, that's good to hear. <laughs> when I rate a film, I try to have at least a healthy combination of the measurable qualities or at least my interpretation of the measurable qualities of a film so style directing yeah. acting music and you know overall writing and i try to put my personal experience like my enjoyment factor a bit to the side and whereas these these individual qualities can affect my enjoyment for sure uh when it comes down to it most people connect with films in terms of their overall enjoyment based on tone and personal preference. And just like you said with Antichrist or even Isle of Dogs, Ralph, there's mm -hmm. qualities to these films that we can all agree are very, very well done by any measurable standard that we could apply to it. But mm. the enjoyment of a film comes out of your personal experience. There's certain stories that you might relate to more than others. There's certain characters that you might relate to more than others. And I'm not going to consider a film bad or give it a low rating just because my personal experience through life isn't one that demands that kind of uh, experience from the narrative so mm -hmm. i would i would give it a seven sure yeah. i thought it was a good well-made film i would recommend it to people it was by measurable qualities very well made uh it just didn't mm -hmm. it didn't uh challenge didn't me scratch that enough itch. yeah yeah. Again, it's a preference thing. <laughs> That's yeah, all there is to it. I mean, I think it's for what it is, and what it is is a coming of age comedy. I guess it's comparable to Lady Bird or, you know, this is England in some way. But I think it's like a perfectly executed yeah. coming of age movie and all the acting's great and it has a style to it and just like yeah. lo like the locations they found in this were like amazing. Mm. There was like that They're rock good. fucking thing with trees they were good. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't blown I mean, away guess, by any single quality in this film. I was. I mean, I guess it's a thing where I don't watch a lot of movies from New Zealand either. So just yeah. To be fair, a lot of the landscape. scenery just in the country is like everything yeah. in this movie. Which is good. <laughs> yeah, which is fine with me because I, I think that's I why people watching, from like, the wow, country like so... it so much. It just it's just yeah. a, a good representation of that mm -hmm. that yeah, family. Such a New Zealand. Very and genuine. I love that 
the setting is yeah. such yeah. yeah it feels like a character in the movie itself and you know i love that mm-hmm. i love that authenticity this movie had yeah it was a very genuine movie it was very um true to its roots and in that sense helped bring out a uh, sense of uniqueness but overall in terms of the beats of the story and the overall plot progression i um it felt like it could have been many other films you know there's certain yeah, qualities familiar. that that helped it stand out uh but there was nothing about it not a single quality that i was blown away by oh, it's well, a it's I a cute movie it's a good easy going movie that you can mm-hmm. show family members I think it goes above cute because I thought in ter- it's a comedy too. I just thought it was fucking hilarious. Every joke was spot on, and there's so many great lines in it. Yeah, it was I funny. I laughed. Down. Show don't her your dick. Touch her stuff. tit. Yeah, <laughs> show her your dick. Touch her tit, but don't get her pregnant. <laughs> I like the I like the one about maybe ET looks normal on his own planet. <laughs> yeah, that was oh my god. That whole segment was excellent too. Where he's trying to be his profound, mom. and that's the best. Mm-hmm. Thing. <laughs> Yeah, but that's brilliant. Yeah, it's it so much about his character. Yeah. That his the mom told him to get a job, fun. and he's like, "Yeah, the father, he was fucking great." That's he was Taika probably Waititi, my favorite uh, character. I can't say his yeah. name. Taika Waititi. Taika Waititi. Yeah. Taika, Taika yeah. Waititi. Why, Titty? <laughs> what I like about his character is that he is a man child. He is yeah. he is the definition of a man child. Yeah. But he's he's not the when you say man child, it's normally like a negative thing. Like when I when I hear Manchild, I I think of fucking Will Ferrell and Step Brothers I, I, or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking the Where exact just, same thing. I fucking hate that shit in like those Will Ferrell movies. Baby but, man. Yep. The yeah, boss baby. There's there's something about this one <laughs> where where it just works. There's something more natural about it. This it, it's more believable. There are yeah. people that exist that are this immature. Yes. It doesn't go to that yeah. next level where it's so over the top and ridiculous that you just sat there yeah. thinking. It's not like, just constant <laughs> screaming. He's not yeah. obnoxious. Yeah. And it's yeah. like his his son genuinely looks up to him and thinks he's the coolest fucking yeah. guy yeah. ever. And, and he thinks he the, thinks he's the coolest, coolest guy. guy ever. Yeah, yeah. But he's not. He's the lamest piece of shit you could yeah. find. Yeah. <laughs> he's so incredibly lame. Yeah, it it, uh-huh. it it plays on the same kind of elements and and themes to some degree as as this is England with a you know fatherless figure looking for role models wherever he can. Mm-hmm. You know, any mm-hmm. kind of older adult male, it doesn't really matter what qualities they have, they're going to adopt it and are going to be manipulated by it in a sense. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. I really enjoyed the dynamic when he entered his life and he was able to get revenge on the bullies in uh, yeah. in pretty much the same way that it was inflicted upon him. It's like, oh, well, I've got an older family member that can beat your family member up now. And, <laughs> you know, I liked that. I liked but how it was they... so incredibly lame. That's that was the yeah. great part. <laughs> but it, but his son just looks like, oh my god, my dad's yeah. doing this for wow. me. It's the coolest thing ever. Wow, he's so cool. I enjoyed the that the kid had a shitty haircut the entire movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I love that too. Yeah, that added some comedy to it. I enjoyed how the father is so fucking stupid that he has no <laughs> idea where this money is buried. Like, <laughs> yeah. there should be one large hole, not two hundred holes spread out uh-huh. you know you should have some <laughs> you should know whether or not you were right next to the fence you know at mm-hmm. least you should you should at least know that but apparently he didn't these holes were yeah. equally spread out through the throughout the entire fucking field which i found kind of funny he's just totally yeah. inept in every way there's a thing the goat character yeah in any other movie that would just be a yeah. stupid gag right <laughs> like oh he has a goat that he talks to how fucking crazy mm-hmm. but they the goat comes back and he eats the money and i'm like oh my god this goat actually had a purpose in the story and it comes back and again the goat, after that and it comes back yeah again and he gets run over which you're not expecting because you thought mm. the goat thing paid off but it didn't and he there's there's so many things like that in this movie that are like wow he really ironed out the script everything needs to be here honestly i don't know as soon as i saw the goat i was thinking he would probably eat something important and then as soon as he put the money really? in the car I knew that that was exactly what was going to happen. There's been so oh. many movies where goats show up to eat something important to the character. Honestly, that happens well, a lot. When my when um my parents moved into their house in New Zealand, it it came with a goat. So nice. Yeah. So <laughs> at least it's more fitting it for the environment. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. What was his name? Did I don't know. I, I don't know. It was before. Did I was you born, eat him? So. Yeah. Or did you just didn't have eat him? him? No, he just lived there. He just, just lived in the garden. Oh. Yeah. Well, that was the and first thing my roommate said when the goat sheep. died. 
They the goat died in the movie and they buried it and then my roommate went, "Why did they just eat him?" <laughs> At least in this, this in this story the goat is more fitting because it's in the environment. <laughs> but there's a lot of yeah. movies where, you know, they would be in a completely different setting and there's a goat. It's just like, "Ooh, it just happens to be a goat here." You know, and then it's even more yeah. obvious. So And what a goat's known yeah. for? Oh, you're eating everything. Eating paper and other things. It's like, oh, okay, mm. they're, they're going to eat something. Did you see as that soon as I see Alex? a goat in a movie. Uh, the first time I saw it, no. No, didn't yeah. even think about that. Because like, a goat just being there isn't that weird to me. Yeah. 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 In, in, so I yeah perhaps if context. I were more familiar with New Zealand, I would just be like, oh, it's a part <laughs> of the aesthetic. <laughs> but That's how I took it. Mm. I, I enjoyed the fact that it's um, short and sweet. It's only like an hour and 20 minutes long. And I feel mm-hmm. I feel like it could be one of those things where if, if it was approaching two hours, it could have started to get maybe a bit annoying or too I much. I agree with or, you there. Yeah. Yeah. But I still do wish I got more out of the film. Yeah. I, I don't I don't think I needed anything more out of the film than what it was. I, I think a under short, the... simple coming of age yeah. story. Mm-hmm. And like Ooh. the dramatic elements are there enough so that the the movie has some weight and some tension, but... I don't think it needed any more drama than it than it had. Yeah. Yeah. Under the the context and intent of what is trying to be achieved here, I think there isn't that much to criticize. Like, yeah, not really. Like it is exactly what he wanted it to be, you know. And mm-hmm. it's it's well like, executed and it's a good comedy. The dramatic so elements are okay, but I feel like the comedy was always the most important thing to this movie, exactly. and, and you watch yeah. it as a comedy. That's I can I can criticize it for not going to you know far enough in the dramatic department but i don't think that's what it was going for that's why i think it's like perfect for what it is that's why i have like no complaints with it i think the biggest takeaway from this uh, podcast episode is that a lot of things just come down to personal preference and um yeah mm-hmm. ralph doesn't like uh isle of dogs or like, alex like doesn't movies. like antichrist <laughs> and when i mm-hmm. i'm not a as big of a fan of uh boy you know it's just mm-hmm. down to personal preference and uh as long as the person that is uh, arguing against a film isn't me, then they're not an asshole. So I think, that's, I think that's the lesson that we learned today is that uh-huh. when I don't isn't like something, I'm crazy. an asshole. And how? Yeah. Yeah. You just want to be contrarian. Yeah. I'm only doing it just to just to have a different opinion. But uh, uh-huh. as long as you're not me, you're in the clear. And that's what we learned today. How, how dare people have different interpretations of art? Yeah. What the yeah. fuck? What the fuck? Not like that's the point. Or anything, mm. mate. You're anything not... else about boy? No, I uh, think we should uh, head on to questions. What were you guys? What yeah. would you guys uh, give this movie out of ten? I'd give it uh, either four or four and a half stars. Can't remember what I gave it. All right. Mm. Okay. I might go with a perfect five star rating. Oh wow! Really? For what it is, I think for what it is, it's it's fantastic. Yeah. And I I would nice. watch it again. This might be the very first podcast episode where my rating for a film that was recommended was lower than anyone mm. else's. I think every other episode, it's been higher. I thought you hated everything. Oh, yeah. That's I hate everything. Rough. I just want to hate things to be <laughs> Oh, <contrarian>. that's right. <laughs> We're all a bunch of hate mass haters. Yeah. I don't have real opinions. I just look at what's popular, and I automatically don't like it, and I'm not giving it a <laughs> Adam, chance. You don't, even, you don't even watch movies. You just yeah. fucking just hate it. <laughs> if it has you just rating. read all the like Rotten Tomatoes reviews. The only reason I didn't love A Quiet Place is because I already decided whether or not I wanted to love it based on the trailer. That's how uh, my mind okay. works. I-, I was gonna see it this week. Should I go see it? Do you think I would like it? Um, Honestly, I I'm dying to know what you think of it. Yeah. So I would recommend you. We could talk about it. You might enjoy it. Everybody seems to mm-hmm. be enjoying it, but at the same time, uh, you might also. Be constantly asking yourself why these characters are taking so many unnecessary risks. You might also be thinking about the world they presented and how it falls apart under the slightest scrutiny. But uh, mm-hmm. th- that, apparently, off. that's not how you're supposed yeah. to watch movies, though. You're supposed to turn <laughs> off your brain. <laughs> and by turn off your brain, you mean also care. turn off every part of your brain that could possibly appreciate a film. So yeah, yeah just, just you know, fall asleep and then you'll like it. You'll just, like every movie you if, know, you're, if you're if yeah, you're just, just unconscious. Be in, be in a coma. And yeah. turn the movie on, and you'll like it. Yeah, right. turn off your brain. Literally, just go into a coma and watch movies that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's Good. what I hate about Questions? people telling me to turn off my brain. <laughs> oh God! <It's> because, <laughs> no. <laughs> hold on. I, I just want to say one thing. It's like <laughs> right. if you if you turn off your brain, then you you can't appreciate a film either. So it's like, what the fuck are yeah. you doing watching a movie? Because I that's how I, I can't I can't turn off one. my brain. My brain is what I use to experience the movie. 
You know, mm-hmm. what the fuck would I be doing if I was watching a movie with my brain turned off? Ready Player One is one of those yeah. where people said, I just got to shut my brain off. Yeah. I thought the movie was fucking horrible. What they really mean is don't criticize things that I like. Yeah. Anyway. What it comes down, again, it's preference. Like, if you think it's fun, then that's fine. Mm-hmm. I did not think it's fun, and I have reasons yeah. for not thinking it. Apparently, I'm not allowed to think that A Quiet Place wasn't <laughs> amazing. So, anyway, uh, right. let's get on well, to the well, questions. Yeah, guys. let's get on the questions. Enough of our complaints. Yeah, before I, before I go on a <laughs> rant here. Yeah, a whole other tangent. All right. Yeah. Uh, so I picked out some questions. How about you, Alex? I looked at them. Oh, didn't okay. choose any. You didn't, you didn't pick out any. All right. <laughs> I just looked at so, yours. All right. So this guy keeps asking questions every time because he wants me to read out his username. And I mm. guess I just have to. So this guy, he has a good question. So Okay. Uh, this So you, Ralph, you are a huge fag, asks, mm. who are some lesser known independent directors that you predict will blow up and deliver something big and great within the coming years? Anybody first? Because I, I, I would have said Taika Waititi, but he did a Thor movie, so it doesn't really <laughs> count anymore. Uh, oh, that's a shame. That's you... like my only choice. Really? Would you still not count him because he did Thor? Because Thor is good for what it is. You can't. He 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 is not. He is not a lesser known up and coming director. Yeah. He is not. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I just yeah. forgot the question. So I, imagine <laughs> Thor doesn't exist, and then that's my pick. <laughs> okay. All right. The Safety brothers for me. The guys yeah, who did um, time. And Heaven Knows What is pretty fucking good too, I gotta say. Yeah. I saw that recently. I will I, extend not as that good, definition but... of lesser known and up and coming because that is only among film heads. Mm-hmm. But yeah, in the film community, they're at least fairly well known at this point. Uh, apparently not oh, at the yeah. Oscars. They don't know they exist. So. Oh, of course not. Why would they? My answer would be uh, David Bruckner. He has directed um, segments of anthology horror film so he did the first third of the 2007 film the signal not to be confused with the 2011 or 2014 film the signal which is much more terrible okay. david bruckner's segment in the by the way have you seen the signal either of you no, it's 2007? no okay well i've, I've seen, seen it. I'll, I'll keep i'll keep that in mind um and so the signal was an anthology kind of uh one third of the film uh each directed movie his segment blew the other ones out of the water like his was incredibly competent then he did um a segment in uh, the first vhs film the best one there Which also was he it, would, it was amateur night uh so the one with yeah. the uh, uh siren character and the guys in the oh, camera one. and the, the guys with the glasses thing. like that was yeah. easily the best segment out of probably any vhs movie or at least that one and uh, he did a segment in um, the film Southbound, which was pretty good. Uh, I would say it's the best one, the most competent out of that film, although it wasn't nearly as good as the segments he directed for those other two films. His first feature film is called The Ritual, which is out on Netflix. Very mm. competent horror movie. And he is still not a named director because that is his first one. And because the script kind of sucks. He didn't write the script, though. Okay. And this was his first actual project where someone's saying, like, here, we're giving you a budget. You can make this movie. I have no way to back up this claim, but somebody sent me a message in my in my um, business email thing saying that they worked with this uh, studio and they were actually the ones to recommend David Bruckner because they had heard about him through my videos. No way to back up that claim, but that mm-hmm. would be very interesting if that's what happened. But he is like the the directing in that film, the ritual. It it's it's so incredibly competent, and yeah, it it's is. easily the best part of the film. Have you seen the ritual? Yeah, I watched it a couple of days ago. Yeah. in the UK, it's on um, Amazon Prime yeah. for free instead of Netflix. The movie's oh, okay. not amazing, but it's because the script is kind of holding it down, and some of the characters are like actually unbearable. But hmm. the directing in this film is just like holy crap! This guy is gonna this guy is gonna make something that everybody's gonna love. He's gonna make like the horror film of every three to five years that's actually good you know (laughs) people get pissed off when i say there's not a good horror movie every year but you also have to remember the takeaway is that it's just personal preference okay Mm -hmm. (laughs) so there's usually uh it's usually one every year no i disagree you you did (laughs) you did remind me though of um the guy who made it follows david robert mitchell yeah he's got another one coming out too uh huh. Which I hear is fantastic. Oh yeah, it, it looks, looks awesome. Great. Andrew Garfield. What's it called? But yeah, that guy seems really promising. It follows is such a great horror movie. The director of The Witch has probably got some cool stuff coming out. 
Oh, him too. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of starting horror movies. A lot of new, interesting mm-hmm. voices in in horror films, which I'm very excited about because I love well done horror films. It's just I don't Same. believe that there's a good one every year, and I watch mm-hmm. any one of them that anyone would says says is good. <laughs> I just don't agree. Uh, Under the Silver Lake, that's what it's called. There's a horror movie that's coming out that's got amazing reviews uh, being uh, distributed by A24 called uh, Hereditary. I'm kind of excited for that. Let's see if it's good. It looks like it could be awesome. Who knows? In terms of up-and-coming directors... um, You gave a good list. I think we gave a good list. Well, yeah, those are are mostly horror movies. I think um, Michael Franco, Michel Franco, is probably going to make something that blows up beyond mexico he's got like three movies one of them's chronic starring tim roth which is the only one of his that's in english uh i thought it was awesome april's daughter was awesome i haven't seen after lucia yet but the biggest fucking problem that i have is that the blu-rays of these films and quite often all kind of releases even itunes and everything they're only in mexico and it pissed me off especially because chronic is is, has tim roth in it and it's in English and set in America, but it was at the Blu-rays only in fucking Mexico, and it pisses me off. And I would love for his films to get more popular because I think that he's very talented. Like the only thing that I have any kind of an issue with in his films is like some of the white balance in the camera, but the okay. exposure settings and shit. There's but an, there's hmm. another guy. He'll he'll figure that out once he gets to Hollywood. Yeah, the I, guy. Um... Once he's making Marvel movies, <laughs> like all these guys are. Yeah, let me let me. Um, yeah, Alex, have you it, thought of any? Just a quick, yeah. Sky called Michael Bay. Oh, Michael Bay's a good one. Yeah, uh, his Transformers series. It's a little indie underground thing. You know, <laughs> like pusher. So hopefully that takes off one day. Mm-hmm. The last one especially was really <sighs> really awesome. Yeah, it was really unique. He shot it with oh. uh, an IMAX 3D. Here's the last one I'm gonna give. Um, Trey Edward Schultz, uh, who is not a name director at this point. Kresha was awesome. It Comes at Night was awesome, although much more controversial. Mm-hmm. A lot of people hated it. Um, but Because they sold it as a horror movie. Well, so. yeah, I mean... I love that This film. guy is a very... I love it, too. ...very talented director with a very interesting style. And It Comes at Night, not super accessible, but he will make something that everybody loves. He's going to he's gonna make mm-hmm. a movie... Because nobody's going to fucking remember that it's the same director as It Comes at Night. Who knows, they might not even yeah. put it on in the fucking marketing material just because it was so controversial. But he's going to make mm-hmm. something that people fucking adore in the future, I think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So those are my predictions. That's a, That's good, a good recommendation. Pick. I even think of that. Mm-hmm. I guess because he's a big... Well, he's not in Hollywood, but he's made a big movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, all right, next question. Go for it. Yeah. All right. Opinions on Can banning Netflix originals. Because I I was kind of pissed when I heard this. Oh, this is from Deleted, by the way. That's the username. Did you guys hear about this? Uh, yeah, yeah, I heard about it. Uh, they I were. Think it's horrible. They were threatening the ban for a long time. So mm. why are they that fragile? That like, oh, this new medium yeah. is really scary. That that's what I don't like about it. When Okja played there, Okja played at this festival, and everyone booed when the Netflix logo came up. Why? Because because it's that's a part of can is booing. Yeah. It's like, that's literally a part of, all of the best movies get booed at Cannes. Synecdoche, New York got booed at Cannes, you know? Like, people boo yes. every fucking movie that comes into Cannes, because that's a part of the experience. <laughs> and that's what makes it exciting, yeah. is that it's a bunch of French people in a small town that are really fucking pretentious, that decide, <laughs> that, that think they have the uh, authority, the authoritative voice on whether or not a film should succeed. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, I would love to go to this festival, you know? I would love to be invited someday. But uh, it is invite only too, like super fucking exclusive, really? hoity-toity, holier than thou festival. Yeah. But a lot of crazy fucking shit happens there in terms of like indie film and foreign film. It's one mm-hmm. of the most uh, legitimate and reputable film festivals out there, if not the most. It's probably the most. Yeah. Yes, I would have yeah. to say. Yeah, with Toronto Cannes. coming in second, I would say. Uh huh. And then Sundance around there. Sundance yeah. and Toronto, I'd say, are like flip flop. Um, nah, Toronto's. Yeah, whatever. I'm biased. But uh, I, I just don't... Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm biased, too. Uh, and Alex has some British one, which he thinks is the best, whatever. No, but I, like, I don't. Yeah, like, probably not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't like this idea where like you just can't count a movie because of something that has nothing to do with the quality of the movie. And I'm sure you guys feel the same way. They've always been very like pro 
indie in a sense. Like they have restrictions on what your budget can be. It can, you know, if your budget is too oh, high, really? they won't take it. Yeah. Oh shit! So, Isn't solo playing at can? <laughs> A lot of people that are complaining about this, and I personally disagree with it myself, but a lot of the people that are hearing this news story on Reddit and complaining about it, they don't really have any idea of what can is. It's not a Toronto Film Fest. It's not a Sundance. It's a very different film festival vibe and experience with all these fucking weird rules and all these hoity-toity people booing movies, you know? Mm -hmm. so. I, think I feel it's like the they make exceptions for certain people. What do you mean? Well, let's say Lars von Trier made a little movie. He's banned. Went over the... He got banned he from is? Can. Yeah, after his I'm a Nazi Why? comment. Oh, yeah. Because he oh, said he's a Nazi okay. and they banned him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me, yeah, let me use another example. So they won't, let's they say won't Michael take him back. Michael, uh, yeah, sure. Michael Haneke. Let's yeah, say they love him. Big budget. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll accept him. And they, they're playing solo there as far as I know. It, it, no, it's probably... No, 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 no. Because they, they do accept uh, some larger budget films to be screened there as part of a um, kind of mutual promotional okay. idea but they are not, not part of the they're not a part of the competition so they have in okay. competition films and out of competition fucking b movie premiered at can <laughs> <laughs> i'm not even kidding there, look it up online you can see youtube videos of, of jerry seinfeld doing his fucking press bullshit at, at oh can with b movie he's wow. dressing up in a b suit in this little fucking town in france that's it's amazing. hilarious. It's just, just that is just it's so dumb to me that they're they act all artsy fartsy and then well they, they need the money too. Movie premiere there, you know, sure. but they're out of competition. Obviously, the competition is what's important. But Netflix is this. It gives like a platform to people with no money and no voice to mm -hmm. make a movie and for it to get seen. And then Can goes like, ah, fuck them. Their movies are getting seen and they're making money. Fucking yeah. ban those because they're just they're so morally they're so opposed to the idea of it. Their reasoning is that Netflix should adhere to the same rules that they have for other films is that they need to screen them in French theaters for, I think, like at least two weeks before releasing it anywhere else. And I think that that's one of the rules in Cannes that applies to every other film as well. Um, but with films like Okja and I think there was another one that year. Netflix actually refused to take part in those rules. And so I think that's their reasoning behind mm -hmm. it. I believe Netflix actually refused to do that. And so they were given a warning and Can said, look, you got to if you want to have it on Netflix, that's fine. But you need to screen it in French theaters for X amount of time before having it on Netflix exclusively. To my understanding, Netflix didn't want to do that. And so Ken's like, okay, we're going to ban you. I might not have the best um, understanding of the whole situation, but that's what I gather from what I've read or what I can remember. French culture is, is very preservative in a way. And right. in the same way that Quebec is very um, preservative of its language, uh, French cinema is trying to be very preservative of the authentic uh, theatrical experience. And so obviously can of all places, is going to be at the forefront of trying to preserve cinema as an experience. And that's kind of what they're afraid of with Netflix. Perhaps they actually just added those rules because Netflix was a part of the competition in previous years. That could have been a rule that they just made yeah. up just for Netflix that technically applies to everybody, but is only for Netflix. And so I can understand where they're coming from. I disagree with it. I don't think that it's necessary. I think that it's causing much more problems than you know the solutions or the benefits that they would be getting from this decision i disagree with it overall but i don't think that it's as black and white as a lot of people are making it out to be okay that's fair i think at the end of the day if you make a good movie it should supersede yeah. any bullshit controversy well, around it there's already tons of restrictions yeah exactly you know yeah. even not including that you know can has a very strict set of rules to begin with so yeah I don't even agree with the, uh, the the screening thing. The Oscars have the same thing where you got to screen your movie in theaters. And it's oh. just like, why? What, what if yeah. it's a great movie that you put on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is kind of. I, I mean, I know. Dumb, I know that's, that's a silly. That's a silly. There's example. a lot of nonsense like, rules in any organization. Mm hmm. But film is is changing and growing as an art form where it's now, you know, a lot of people watch movies at home. So there are going to be movies great movies soon that are just going to be released on netflix or amazon just fucking plopped on there and that'll yeah. be it i think netflix might be done with great movies though 
Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's, I think, um, I think that seems like a trend recently. Paths. They're like, eh, mm -hmm. we just need more content. Well, to be fair, it's it is it's also early in the year, mm -hmm. and a lot of studios tend to release their stuff later in the yeah, year. Yeah, that's the, true. Good, the good stuff. Yeah. So, I'll give them till yeah. let's say let's say November. If by November they keep up this trend, we'll we'll uh, call them a bunch of hacks. <laughs> okay, Alex, do you have anything to add to this uh, can thing? It fits into the what was it? Steven Spielberg came out recently didn't he saying of the closet i don't think netflix movies deserve oscars <laughs> oh that's dumb what came out no not in that way <laughs> that's yeah dumb. yeah he came out saying netflix movies don't deserve oscars what an old fart yeah it does come across as if he's just like completely <laughs> not with it it's like roger ebert and video games or david lynch and phones yeah exactly <laughs> yeah it's just the growing <laughs> pains of a, of a evolving format. Like they're gonna yeah. have to get with the times eventually. Like we're Move gonna on. get films that are quality and that deserve recognition on these platforms. And it just yeah. takes. It's gonna. There's just gonna be one that's gonna be so good that they they're gonna have to change their rules. I mean, like eventually, mm -hmm. Manchester by the Sea was an Amazon Studios film. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that was released in theaters. Beasts of No Nation seven. was a Netflix film, and that got a lot of buzz it should have i mean got no would, oscars yeah no oscar buzz yeah 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 because again they didn't count it but uh manchester by the sea amazon film yeah mm -hmm. that got tons so it's of already, attention it's, it's already happening then basically yeah yeah but that's an amazon film with you know known actors and a big budget and you know so since when is someone. idris and elba not a known actor they didn't really sit in theaters well i saw it, it actually uh i saw a screening at toronto film festival so i did see it in the theater but they didn't have a wide release i don't think Oh, okay. I don't. I think it needs to be a wide release or like a limited release for two. Yeah, weeks I think something. Netflix should uh, encourage theatrical releases, but I can see why they're not doing it for the same reasons that Can wants them to. They don't want to, because Netflix yeah. wants to replace yeah. theaters. That seems to be their goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Different interests of businesses conflicting with each other. I'm always number one, the filmmaker. Yeah. So it's just a shame that filmmakers have to suffer through this bullshit mm -hmm. <laughs> to get their movie seen. <laughs> what do you say? Uh, one more question and we wrap this up? Sure. Yeah. This one's from Neo Soul 727 What is the worst thing affecting film culture right now? YouTube film critics, mainly Ralph and Alex. Oh, that's a good one. That's probably yeah, one of the worst uh, <laughs> things happening to cinema. I think that they are devaluing and degrading and honestly just making films a worse uh, medium for people to enjoy. Now I can't even enjoy it. I kind of wish that their mm -hmm. channels disappeared. That's fair. Yeah, You're I agree with that one. one. Yeah. Yeah, I agree too. Hold on, let me slip my wrist <laughs> real quick. <laughs> um, mine would be cashing in on uh, nostalgia. Yeah. Um, we're getting <sighs> yeah. to a point where... Um, we're running out of things to be nostalgic for. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. with be it Star Wars, Jurassic Park, Stranger Things, with all the 80s shit. Oh, yeah. Ev <laughs> just ev everything yeah. at, at the moment. All the most popular things are based on things of old. So yeah. if, if, the, if this trend of everything, all the biggest films, right, all the biggest franchises being based on stuff that was created decades ago, mm -hmm. it's just going to crumble on its own weight eventually. You know what's mm -hmm. fucking hilarious about all of that is that they're cashing in on nostalgia for around our age range and also that of uh, people who are alive in the 80s or appreciate 80s film culture. Yeah. Which means that if all of the films out in theaters are just nostalgia cash grabs, then the nostalgia of 20 to 30 years from now will also be 80s <laughs> themed films. Yeah. Because they'll be yeah. cashing in on the nostalgia of the remakes that we're cashing in on the nostalgia. <laughs> yeah. So I find that yeah, hilarious we'll that we're things. just we've created a never ending loop that I hope we escape from someday. Probably won't. There's a pretty Freddy good um, one is right. There's a good Frank Zappa quote that goes, Death by nostalgia. It isn't necessary to imagine the world ending in fire or ice. There are two other possibilities. One is paperwork and the other is nostalgia. When you compute the length of time in between the event and nostalgia for the event, the span seems to be about a year less in each cycle. Eventually, mm. within the next quarter of a century, the nostalgia cycles will be so close together that people will not <laughs> be able to take a step without being nostalgic for the one they just took. At that point, oh. everything stops. That was That's deep, incredible. bro. 
That's Yo, that's like profound. Did he smoke a bunch of wed before saying that? Almost definitely. Wow, dude. dude. I love that. Oh man. I, I got to find it, that quote and copy and paste it and make it my background on my desktop. That's brilliant. I've got an answer. I would say that the absolute worst thing happening to films is audience complacency. And that that ties itself into what you said also, Alex, because this entire culture of nostalgia and remakes and blah, 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 or even the oversaturated superhero market, these things wouldn't exist if they weren't sellable. You know, this they exist because we as a consumer society have voted with our wallets and said, yes, this is what I want. And so you can't even really blame the market for understanding that and making films based on that. You have to blame the audience. And I very much do. Mm -hmm. And that is part of why I like to be critical. That is part of why I feel as though a higher standard for films needs to be demanded is that we will get better films because of it, you know? That is why I cover so many foreign and indie films on my channel is because I want there to be more of a market, more of a variety. If people just keep seeing the exact same movie over and over again that they've already seen, then that's what we're going to get next year. You know, we see all these fucking Reddit yeah. posts complaining about like, oh, no, they're remaking Spider-Man or, oh, no, they're remaking this or Jumanji or blah, blah, blah. And then everybody will go fucking see it. You know, in the same way that people mm -hmm. complain about the fucking emoji movie before it comes out and it's like, I'll see it ironically. You realize you're basically just telling them, yes, please make a sequel. And then those same people go on the Internet and go, really, they're making a sequel? Oh, how did it make enough money? Because you fucking <laughs> saw it. You voted with your wallet. You are asking them to give you more of the same shit by seeing the same shit over and over and over again. It is the audience's fault. That's my answer. Mm. That's that's at you, Alex. You're the one who paid to see Emoji Movie. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is your fault. We've all paid to um, see shit films. We've all paid to see the Black yeah. Panther. You know, mm -hmm. at least I try yeah, to keep mine thing. like more, um, more uh, staggered. You know. Uh huh. Well, aside from that horrible violin sound effect I always complain about <laughs> in every movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think Rotten Tomatoes is probably the worst thing. I, we've gone yeah. so in depth with Rotten Tomatoes before, but that system where you just got to make a movie that's okay, and everyone will rate it a six out of ten, and it'll get a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and everyone will think it's the greatest movie ever made, yeah. and they'll all go see it. And it's a system that propels mediocrity and means anyone from trying perpetuates. My apologies, <laughs> I'm tired. Well, both. I mean, either acceptable. I just yeah. thought that. I guess so. Perpetuates mediocrity. And it keeps filmmakers from trying new things at, at, at fear that the Rotten Tomato score will be lower. Yeah. Because controversy lowers the score. It does encourage more easy, inoffensive mm -hmm. kind of films that don't take risks. Yeah. Well, Hollywood always tries to find that formula. What's the way to make the mm -hmm. most money? And the way to make the most money now is to have a good Rotten Tomato score. Well, that's a big factor. Yeah. So they make movies that are okay and appeal to as many people as possible on purpose mm -hmm. to get as high of a rating as possible. Or, in Disney's case, they offer favors to critics, which is what <laughs> yeah. they do. Uh, I know you like Last Jedi, Alex, but 90... What does it have? A 95%? Something like that. Something what, really Rotten Tomatoes? Yeah. The, 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 the disparity between the critics and the audience is ridiculous in that case. And it makes me think uh, maybe Disney offered them, not money, they didn't write them a check, but like, <laughs> we'll give you some advertising, you know, a little advertising thing here and there. Yeah. <laughs> so, favors, you know, favors. You get to go to a premiere, stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. L pamper them a little. Yeah. yeah There's a lot of people that seem to think that uh, Rotten Tomatoes scores, especially for that movie, are completely dependent on that sort of thing. There's a lot of people that seem to think that that sort of thing never happens. I think it's a bit of both. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bit of both. I yeah. think that both It's not are like it's true. rigged, but Yeah. It's like it's a definitely rigged. a thing that happens, <laughs> but it's also yeah. you can't account for every single rating on the site because of that. Mhm. Mm of course. All right. Um All right. Uh, is that we all answered? We did it. Yeah, we did. I gotta recommend a movie. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. You yeah. should uh, recommend uh, your next uh, movie for us to watch. So I was uh, picking between a funny movie and a serious movie, but Alex picked a fucking great comedy. So I'm gonna go with the more serious one. Whoop. 
This is a film. Hold on, let me look up some info on this, just so I get everything right. Oh, okay. You don't even know what you're recommending. Well, I do, <laughs> but I want, I want all the info right in front of me. So this is a film from 1975 by my favorite director, Stanley Kubrick. Hmm. It's Barry Lyndon. Nice. It is one of thank you one of my favorite movies ever. That's one of them that I haven't seen. Yes. Yes. Yeah, same. same. That's one you. of the ones I haven't oh, seen. Oh, perfect. This is the most underrated movie ever made. Awesome. It is fucking brilliant, and it is the most gorgeous looking movie ever. Top five okay. movies ever for me. So, I'm excited to talk about it. I already have it on Blu-ray. So, um, mm -hmm. thank you. It's cause... become a meme with Adam because everyone's like. Adam hasn't seen Barry Lyndon, <laughs> like really? every thread that hates you. What? Because yeah. I, I look, I look to see what you haven't seen. Oh. And there's the big list and like, he hasn't seen Barry Lyndon. What a fucking piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> now, people can't say that. Well, yeah. Perfect. And you know what I fucking hate? I'll, I'll, I'll keep this short. <laughs> okay. You know what I fucking hate about people that say that is they seem to completely uh -huh. ignore the fact that... I could be doing the same fucking obnoxious thing to them. I could be pointing out all these different fucking current indie and foreign language films and be like, you've never fucking seen blah, blah, blah. Like, there's so many other movies that I decide to watch because I like to, to see as many things as possible from any given year. And so that obviously takes away from my time. And so it's difficult to go back in time. And so I'm saying thank yeah. you, Ralph, because sometimes I just need a little bit of encouragement to actually watch the film. There's so many films that I'm intending on watching that I just haven't gotten around to yet because I know they're always going to be there. Like, it took me forever to watch Citizen Kane because I'm like, yeah, I can watch really? that at any point, you know? I want to say one more thing about Barry Lyndon. This movie's three hours long. Perfect. And it's very, very dense. So uh, if you're an audience member listening, you can watch this movie in two chunks, hour and a half each. It's split into two acts. Nice. So if that's oh, really? the way you want to okay. do it. I'm very excited. I know a three-hour movie that's a period piece is very a very daunting task for some. Not that that's a bad thing. I can't I wait. I to let you know. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Ralph. Nice. Have fun, guys. And um, anybody who wants to uh, join in on the discussion in the next episode of this podcast, you should watch the film before then, because we are going to have a spoiler discussion and spoil the movie. So watch it mm -hmm. before next episode, which is going to air in two weeks from this episode being posted. All right. Uh, Perfect. Any closing comments or statements? Nah. No? Don't get okay. into the Nazi stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ralph, you want to do I'll your impression to. of a Kiwi accent real quick? I, dude, I, can't, I don't even that's want to. That's why I want you to do it. Myself. <laughs> yeah, that's um, why we want to hear it, boy. So I don't even know where to start with it. Oi. Egg. Okay, oi. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Give me something You're to say. Egg. What's egg. something that... Say, you're an egg. You're an egg. Guys, it's, egg. it's me, Ralph. Ralph. What's up, guys? It's me, Ralph. I'm an egg. That's actually <laughs> oh, not that bad. Wasn't that bad. That was that wasn't bad there at all. Go. What the fuck, <laughs> See, dude? All you gotta do is try. Taika with Kiki, hit me up. I'll fucking be one Hell of your yeah. movies. <laughs> all right, great note to end on. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening. Bye, bye.